I'd like to call the order of the Enfield Inland Wetlands Watercourse Meeting for Tuesday, January 18th, 7 p.m. Um, can we do a Pledge of Allegiance? Is there a button? Oh, here. Sorry. I need to. You should be over there. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do roll call, please. Donna Corbin Zabinski. Here. Virginia Higley. Here. Uh, Carrie Ann Howe, absent. Robert Hendrickson. Here. Kevin Zorda. Here. Kevin. Yep, speak into the mic. I can't hear you. Kevin Zorda. Still not working. Just say here. Here. <laughs> Can you hear us, Kevin? Kevin, can you hear us? Nope. Sound be a little louder. Kevin, can you hear us? Uh, yeah, you're going in and out though. I can't, can't hear you well. Okay. We'll try to speak louder. Next on the agenda is public participation. Is there anybody in the audience that wants to speak on items not on the agenda? Again, anybody want to speak on items not on the agenda? One last call. Anybody want to speak on items not on the agenda? Seeing none, moving forward. Uh, is agent comments? Jimmy, do you have anything? No, nope, I don't have anything. No. Okay. Kevin, do you have anything for comments? No. Okay. Correspondence. Uh, we had an email that came in from Mr. Renna. I'm not sure if I said his name properly from January 11th, and it was regarding this email. We also received other emails regarding the... Um, public hearing, so those will be done later on in the meeting. Uh, we did also receive um, on our desk a pamphlet for regarding the Connecticut In Inland Wetlands Water Course Acts, so that's helpful for people. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see. Next on the agenda is approval of minutes from January 4th. I move to approve the minutes of January 4th. Second. Okay, can I roll call, please? <coughs> Any comments? Discussion? No. Donna Corbin Sabinski. Yes. Virginia Higley. Yes. Carrie Ann Howe. Oh, I'm sorry. She's absent. Robert Hendrickson. Yes. Kevin Zorda. Yes. Okay. All in favor, motion passes. Next is town attorney report. We have none. Um, continuation of public hearing is none. Uh, and item 10 is a new public hearing. It's IW 641. 25 and 35 Bacon Road, application for a wetland permit to construct a distribution center with associated site improvements to the rear of 25 Bacon Road, lot 9465, Adam Withstanley, applicant, WE 35 Bacon Road, LLC owner, map 94, lot 65, and map 95, lot 5, I1 zone. The applicants are at the table. Yes, we are. Could you please your name and address for the records, please? Uh, Valerie Farrow, um, Avon, Connecticut, representing the applicant of Good Earth Advisors. Do you want these two now? Yes, please. Uh, Scott Egan uh, from AECOM. Okay. And you're from what town? Uh, hometown or office town? Office <laughs> 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 question. Uh, Jumpsburg, Massachusetts. Thank you. Hey, good evening, Madam Chair. My name is Jim Petropoulos. I'm uh, a civil engineer with a firm of Hainer Swanson doing business in Nashua and Burlington, Mass. And I reside in Hollis, New Hampshire. Thank you. Would you just like to give a presentation? Yes, Madam Chair, we would. Uh, thank you very much to you, the commission members, as well as the uh, members of the public. Again, for the record, my name is... I think she might be fixing the... OK. There we go. Yeah, before we start, I do want to, um, sorry, I want to have the, explain a few of the rules. Okay. Sure. So the applicants are going to give their name or address, which they did, and then give a statement and uh, presentation regarding their application. You have to keep it on, else Kevin can't hear. It's reverberating. I know, but that's how to use it. I'm just turning the sound off. Okay. I'm not going to hear it. I'm just going to say. 
If you turn the sound off, we can't, can't hear. hear it. We can't hear. Please listen to the sound. He's from listening to both because this is too okay. quiet to pick it up. All right, this is going to reverberate. Put on 65. 65. It's right at Thank you. Okay. We're then going to hear statements from Sorry. the public regarding the topic of the public hearing and the areas of concern for inland wetlands and our regulations only. Uh, we will stop you if you talk about anything else other than inland wetlands. Uh, please do not bring up items related to other agencies and commissions such as the uh, PNZ or the town council. It's only our decision based on our rules and regulations. All those wishing to speak um, should have signed in on the sign-in sheets. And when we call you, you'll have to give your name and address for the record. If at any time the hearing becomes unruly or unmanageable, we will call a recess. The statements from the public are for purposes to be considered in deliberations of the regular meeting. We will then hear statements from the application applicants to address any concerns after the public speaks. Um, prior to the meeting, the applicant had to send notices to the abutting properties, which they did. Um, so now we're on the applicants to give their statements. Thank you very much again for the record. Uh, my name is Valerie Farrow. I'm the president of Good Earth Advisors. I'm representing the applicant WE35 Bacon Road, a, uh, uh, a subsidiary of Win Stanley Enterprises. I would like to do a quick introduction of the development team. You heard to uh, my right, Scott Egan from AECOM. To my left, Jim Petropoulos from Hainer Swanson. Um, we also have Tom Cody, our attorney from Robinson Cole. And we also have Adam Win Stanley in the middle. Rosa Sakula from um, also Win Stanley, also the property manager for 25 Bacon. Would you like to sit up here at the table? Do we have chairs for them? Yeah. Open up chairs. Yeah, if you want to swap out two chairs, you folks can sit with us if you like. Tom, we need three. We have chairs. So while they're doing that, I just have, for the record, I did want to introduce our credentials. I know there was a question by a number of, uh, of the public uh, regarding our uh, credentials and our background. So I think this would pretty much satisfy that. Mm -hmm. Do we need two more? Here. Is that good? Yep. Thank you. Okay. So we have Tom. Rose is going to stay back there. Okay. Tom and Adam are, are, are wing, uh, wing people. <laughs> Welcome. Um, so first let me just start by, by certainly thanking the commission for calling this hearing. Um, I think it's going to give the public uh, the opportunity to hear some technical information, clarify some of the things that we're hearing swirling around, and uh, hopefully just really allay any concerns that, that might be out there. Um, for, the, for some folks that, in fact, are living adjacent to the site, um, this might not be the first time they're hearing about the project. In fact, uh, back when we were doing 25 Bacon, we met many of the neighbors after some planning hearings. Uh, Rosa is the property manager, so she's been interacting with the neighbors since 2016. Um, that being said, we did formalize our outreach with the neighborhoods back in August or September, and this included things like setting up a toll-free number, um, a dedicated email, we did some mailings, uh, we've had some small group meetings, we've had some very private one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, I continue to uh, be contacted by phone and email, so we've had con continual exchange with the public, and it's um, really helped us from the get-go to help us make the right decision on what to propose, as well as to understand some of the concerns that are um, obviously still lingering. So that being said, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to present in um, a couple parts. I'm going to start, and um, then we're going to have Scott and, and Jim really add some of the technical uh, details to the presentation. Uh, and then after closure, we'll certainly want to take uh, um, questions. Uh, I should point out that this is not our first discussion about wetlands on the site. Um, back in 2016, we did appear in front of this commission for the redevelopment of 25 Bacon. Uh, we did receive a unanimous decision. Uh, the wetland impacts directly were about 10,000 square feet. 
and the impacts to uh, affecting the upland review area of about 300,000 square feet. So kind of a similar context. Um, so our presentation will really focus on, you know, the wetland impacts tonight. Uh, first, let's bring up, and I will apologize that the, the, we're using very high density images. So they might take a little while and Commissioner Corda hopefully can see this, right? Yes, he can see it. Okay. Um, and Excuse me a second. We cannot hear you at all back there. I'm so sorry. Mm. Let me try this. Oh, no? no? Oh, darn. I never sit still. Okay. Well, but let me... The ver yes, I know. Um, Okay. Well, the bad news is that I just realized for the first time that pointer does not work on the screen. <laughs> and we don't know why, so that might come to It was working. Yeah, we can use the mouse. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to have to sit. Okay. Um, so let's, what, what I'd like to do is I'm going I'm to give some background of, of the site, sort of the history of how when Stanley's, um, control the property and sort of move forward from there. Um, this is the site, um, 25 Bacon, this is the high bay, this is the low bay, there is 324 acres. Um, Adam took control of the property in 2016. He invested about 41 million dollars to basically overcome the functional obsolescence of the Hallmark campus. As you folks know, they've been there for a long time. When he took control of it, it really needed a complete makeover. Um, and um, in doing the redevelopment, we brought in three tenants. Those three tenants are here still today. So we took a building that was one tenant, Hallmark, we divvied it up for three tenants. A little better? A little better. Can you see, can you folks see this in the back? No. <laughs> I can't see that in the front. <laughs> okay, we're going to do this in pieces if you work with me, okay? Just yell like super loud. All right. And can you hear me? Yes? yes. Okay. If you can't hear me, just yell at me, okay? Um, after we did the redevelopment in 2016, we also reconfigured the site. And what we did was we created a real parcel. So we still have the 324 acres. We still have three parcels. They just look differently, okay? And that's how, if you looked at the plans that we submitted, um, why we're calling 35 bacon, 35 bacon, because we did a lot reconfiguration and it created this parcel back here, which is about 181 acres. This remains 25 bacon. And up here is another piece, which is about 22 acres. So tonight, we're really gonna talk about these together. Um, but, but you'll also notice that when we're talking about access and wetlands, we do have some associated with our transition of access as we go from 25 to 35 bacon. Okay? Um, <clears throat> okay, this might be a little hard to see. We're going to try to go through this. I'm going to back out so you can see the big picture first, then we can go in. Okay? Can everyone see that? I'm going to talk a little bit about physical context. So here is 35 bacon. Here's 25 bacon, the existing buildings. Here's our two entrances off Bacon Road. Okay? 
Crescent Lake here, Shaker Pond here. Um, you can notice the Shaker Lake. Shaker Lake, okay. Um, I'm, a, I'm a water resources person, so mm -hmm. I use the hierarchy. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you can see, this area here is very flat. Um, some of the existing wetland systems here that, that Hallmark, when they moved in, uh, uh, avoided, and those remain here. Um, you'll see the wetland systems in a minute. Scott will take you through these on, on both sides and then through, through the site. Um, the site is zoned for industrial use. It's I-1. A number of uses are allowed under this use, uh, including our proposed use as a distribution warehousing facility. Um, the, the industrial zone allows warehousing and distribution as of right. And that's a term we use that, that basically signifies um, a site plan review process as opposed to special permits and other types of specialized approvals um, given a hierarchy of uses. So the I-1 zone is intact. That I-1 zone is been intact, in fact, um, since possibly before Hallmark came in. Um, so it's been several decades. I want to point out besides this uh, area here, which has really been our intent focus to keep development within here, um, to try to preserve this area along here for, for, uh, for many reasons. And um, in addition to that, I wanted to point out just quickly the flows from uh, um, Crescent into Shaker. Okay, so we have wetland systems, we have water resource systems, we have open, uh, open vacant land, we have forested areas on both sides, and then we have some existing mix of both of those types of, of resources down here. Okay, so with that, Scott Egan from AECOM is going to take you through very uh, you know, the details of soils, uh, wetlands, habitat, of that type. What we want to do is just build a layer. So Scott will give you that layer, and then Jim's <coughs> going to come on and talk about the site development. Mm -hmm. okay, so um, my name is Scott Egan. Mm -hmm. um, a wetland and wildlife ecologist with AECOM mm -hmm. out of Chelmsford, Massachusetts. Um, I'm also a certified professional soil scientist. I've pretty much my entire career, about 24 years at AECOM, and is primarily focused as a field biologist, um, delineating wetlands and doing wildlife habitat evaluations and natural community mapping and um, endangered species surveys, things like that. That's my, my primary line of work. Um, I've been working out on this site since the beginning, uh, as far as when Stanley is concerned. Or, or you know, about 2016 is when we first started working out there in preparation for the high bay work. Um, I delineated <clears throat> uh, seven different wetlands out there on the 35 Bacon Road parcel and a few others on the 25 Bacon Road. But of course, we'll just focus on what we worked on for the 35 Bacon Road parcel. Um, the first, first wetland here that we all right, let's see. So I'll do what you did, but yeah, I'll show you the whole <laughs> scene here. So we we delineated wetlands, you know, from the top of the site all the way down. Um, these delineations here were primarily uh, on the left side of the um, existing facility on 25 Bacon Road. That was. Um, those uh, were stormwater ditches that we delineated uh, as part of the high bay work mm -hmm. when we were doing that work. And then we went back um, just last year, last fall, and refreshed all the wetlands that we delineated in 2016 and then added some additional lines along this east side over here to try to um, pick up any kind of um, buffer zone impacts that might uh, occur. Uh, 
knowing that we, no impacts directly to the wetlands would be in, because we knew we weren't going into these wooded areas here, but we wanted to at least make sure we picked up where any kind of uh, buffer zone areas might be. Um, so I'll just start at the top up here. So up here is the top of um, the upper limits of the Shaker Pond area. Um, once you get up into this, this part of the pond, it becomes kind of more of a um, cluster emergent scrub shrub type wetland with open water components to it. Lo doesn't look it more, looks a little less like a pond than actually a big wetland. Um, this boundary is a, a very abrupt boundary. Uh, there's um, with, with a steep topographic break down to the edge of the pond. Uh, there's an old um, drainage feature here that may at one time have been part of runoff from the agricultural field that doesn't really appear to receive water directly from there anymore. Um, this would be wetland two here. It's small, isolated. Um, I've, it has occasionally has, I've seen it with water in it, but I've also seen it dry. Um, but it is outside the limits of the, the project work. Um, this, this area here with the hatching is the limits of the project disturbance, just for your reference. Um, then as you move across, uh, move down the site, how do you get rid of that? <laughs> I don't know. Let's try this. There you go. That's fine. Just drag it. Um, so wetland three, this is the, the farm pond that's in the middle of the site. Uh, this, this pond is man excavated. Uh, it was built sometime we went back and looked at the historic aerial photography from the area, and it was excavated sometime between 1934 and 1952, um, is where it shows up on the aerial photograph logs. Um, it's a uh, pretty deep. They had to deep, dig pretty deep to get to the water table there. It's it's uh, probably several feet below the surface of the adjacent agricultural fields. Um, I've seen it a number of times over the last six years, over the last five years, and it's generally always been pretty full. Um, last fall was the lowest I ever saw it, and there was maybe uh, five or six feet of kind of exposed shoreline there, but most every other time I've seen it, it's been pretty much full right up to the bank of, uh, of, the, of the limits of the pond, which are coincide with the limits of the delineated wetland. Um, let's see. So it is permanently flooded. Um, I think it's possibly nutrient rich, which would make sense because it's got ag fields all the way around it. And there's a pretty dense cover of uh, Lemna minor, which is the um, small aquatic plant that floats on the, on the surface and is oftentimes indica indicative of areas of wetlands that are high in nutrient content. Um, so let's see, as you move down site, we've got two additional wetland areas here, wetland five and wetland four. These were all stormwater ditches that were created during the construction of, um, of, of the uh, 25 Bacon Road site. They receive flow, surface flow from adjacent uplands and probably from the uh, street surface as well. Um, Wetland 5 drains around the west side, down the west side of the building, and then eventually crosses down in, into the system down here. Wetland 4 comes across and goes through a small culvert here and then drops into this ditch here. Now this ditch along the east side up in here is, is well below the adjacent topography it's it's really deeply they had to dig down pretty deep to get that flow to come down through but eventually ties into this wetland system here which has a small water course in it and that all flows in a I keep doing that sorry uh, all flows in a southerly direction down towards um what's the name of that stream down there off site oh the freshwater brook. freshwater brook yeah. thank you um this this system here, this little, there's another little isolated wetland here, wetland six. 
that system never, I've never seen it with water, like standing water in it. It's very shallow, it's a very shallow depression, but it did have hydric soils. Um, and then uh, wetland eight. Uh, we only field delineated the upper portion that's closest to the limits of work, but it, it probably does drain. <laughs> It is probably connected into wetland four over mm -hmm. uh, down into here somewhere. Um, the upland areas of the site are, you know, as you can see from the aerial, are primarily existing agricultural lands, and the forested areas are all really well drained, moderately well drained to excessively drained soils that were formed in glacial fluvial material. So you know, sandy materials that were deposited as the glaciers receded. And um, so they're, they're very well drained and uh, the, the natural communities are pretty typical for those types of soils, which include um, really like white pine, oak type forests. Um, uh, the <coughs> one thing, other thing I'd like to mention about the, the pond here is that it, is, it does appear to be permanently flooded and um, and due to the fact that it's pretty far away from any upland forest habitat, which is primary habitat for amphibians that we use vernal pools. Um, and during our number of visits, we've been out there, we've never seen any evidence of breeding by obligate vernal pool species. So, um, you know, we're pretty sure it's just functioning as more of a pond and you, you could potentially, something you might more likely see um, green frogs or bullfrogs breeding in because they require um, permanent flooded conditions because their tadpoles take one to two years to develop. Um, so I would, uh, I would say it's, you know, from my experience in doing a lot of vernal pool work, it, it would not be functioning as a, as a pool. Um, that covers it. Yeah, it might be it. Back to our, well, we want to talk about this too. Um, yeah, so one other thing that we did with that, um, with the pond, is we submitted um, to the Army Corps a uh, request for an approved jurisdictional determination on the pond. And because it was clearly man made for strictly for the purposes of agriculture, um, they determined it was non jurisdictional, as, as so it's not a waters of the, considered a waters of the U.S. Mm -hmm. So this is just the, the letter we sent in, and we have a response letter from them too. Yes. Stating. Yes. Okay, Jim. Good evening. I will do my best to be. Jim, Jim. What's that? Take that back. Take oh, the mic this way. Okay. I'll do my best to be clear and loud and precise and keep the dialogue moving. I'm going to rely on Val to help me a little with the clicker, though. Okay, I'm clicking, I'm clicking, I'm clicking. <laughs> so I'm really here to <clears throat> present the facts of the proposed development yeah. to you uh, in order for you to make the best decision possible here this evening. What is being proposed is to construct an 819,000 square foot distribution facility and accompanying site improvements on the northern part of the 35 Bacon Road site. Uh, a couple key elements of the plan. Um, the main access will be an extension from the driveway on the east part of the property. Val had mentioned the east curb cut that leads into 25. We want to extend that to the back central portion of the 35 <coughs> Bacon site. And that'll be both for access and egress for the building. Um, the vehicles are free to access around the building. You can see full access around the building. They're also free to, to leave the site on the westerly entrance if they so desire, but we've kind of viewed this as the primary access being along the east driveway. The building itself, uh, Val, if you jump to the next one, that's a little bigger. Yep. Thanks. So the building itself is a one-story, 43-foot high building, a distribution center. Loading. <coughs> It's a, uh, um, as I mentioned, a distribution center that will contain two tenants. 
Uh, the lower tenant we're identifying is tenant A. It is to measure 318,000 square feet. Will contain cross docking on both sides of the building, some 40 trailer parking spaces, and then the automobile parking on the south side of the building for 277 vehicles. On the north side of the building, tenant B is a slightly larger tenant, 501,000 square feet. It will also be cross docked. It will have docks on both sides of the building. We have trailer parking on the west side as well as the north side of tenant B. And on the very north side of tenant B, we have parking for 133 employee parking spaces. Now with regard to earthwork and how this gets built, um, of the 181 acres of 35 Bacon Road, only about 83 acres, so about 46% of, of the parent lot is being disturbed uh, by this development. Um, as Val and, and Scott have mentioned, and, and if you're familiar with the land, you know it's, it's, it's very flat, but it does have slight pitch from north to the south. We've engineered the drawing such that it's a balanced site from an earthwork standpoint. In other words, there's not a, a huge surplus of material that needs to be trucked away or a huge import of material that needs to be brought in. Based on the soils, we do not anticipate any ledge or blasting associated with this project. With regards for utilities for the building, they're pretty much already there, located behind the 25 Bacon building. Uh, they will be extended into 35 to service this building. Next one, Val. <coughs> um, before I talk about stormwater, uh, I just want to describe uh, the watershed in a little bit more detail. Val had alluded to it uh, in her opening remarks. And we've got two maps. Uh, one is a pre-development watershed map. I'm not sure if this is it. Nope. It's the next one. The next one. <laughs> I'm like really trying to aim here and I'm having a hand-eye coordination issue. Okay. There we go. Let's see if we minimize this this mention. Okay. So this is the pre-development watershed. We're trying to get a sense of how things are flowing in, in this part of town. The yellow line that you see on the board is uh, the perimeter of the 35 Bacon uh, Road property. Uh, the purple line is the western limit of the watershed to Shaker Lake. Uh, as we know, Shaker Lake flows in a southerly direction. Uh, it does at its southern tip cross Cottage Road, and it actually comes back onto the, 20, uh, the 35 Bacon Road property right there in that corner where it goes underneath Bacon Road and eventually forms into Job, Job Buck Brook, as I understand it. The pink line in the middle of this plan is kind of an important line. It shows the divide in this property. How, how, how is the 2535 Bacon Road property draining? And that line runs in kind of a north-south direction. It almost parallels Shaker Lake. <laughs> And um, there is a, a thin wedge of the Wind Stanley property that does gravitate and drain towards Shaker Lake and the Westerly property. In the north part there, as Val has the cursor to, it drains towards that little wetland that, that Scott mentioned as well as the lake. And then along the property line of the residents. Okay. And of the 300 in four acres that comprise 25 and 35, about 50 acres are in watershed that head in, the, in that direction. On the other side of that pink line is the watershed that goes in the other direction. And I suspect historically it made its way to Crescent Lake. I think with the rail line there, it somewhat prevents that migration of flow over. We did not find, when we surveyed the property, many cross culverts that were leading in that direction. In fact, we know Crescent Lake um, discharges and then comes on to the subject site and forms Freshwater Brook. So my point of this pre-development map is we got about 50 acres headed to the west, 250 going in the southeasterly direction towards uh, Freshwater Brook, which as Scott mentioned goes underneath Bacon and eventually hooks up with Jawbuck Brook on the other side. And if I could, Jim, just talk a little bit, since I think it's on, my, on their minds, 
what this means um, to us as technical people, when you see two watershed divides and they're close together, um, it creates kind of what, what I call as a watershed student, a, a flashy watershed. So if you can see, you've got somewhat of a perfect storm, if you will, here, because you have a watershed here, line, and you have a, so a basin line here, a basin line here, and you have Shaker Lake in the middle, and then you have a very, very suburbanized watershed. Um, if you look at aerials from 1930 uh, to now, you can see that this watershed here along Shaker Lake has become more and more and more impervious. So when you uh, make a watershed impervious and you have a condition like this, when you have this kind of skinny, think of it, you know, the proverbial 10 pounds of flour in a five pound sack. Um, you've got a broad watershed basin here and foop, all of a sudden it funnels into this um, and, and creates, uh, you know, quite a, quite a flashy watershed. So when it rains, uh, for you folks, it literally pours. Um, so that's just a little bit of watershed 101. Yeah. So that was the pre-development map. Uh, I'm going to quickly talk about the post-development watershed map. Um, and essentially, it, it, it looks quite the same. And the reason being is because we, we, we have not um, massage grades or rework the earthwork for this proposed development because it's really over on the westerly side where we don't have that much proposed. We do have a small area in the north part of the site that's being proposed for a trailer parking area. We did not want to discharge our water towards Shaker Lake, so we're going to create, I'll, I'll talk in a minute about in some specifics up there, but we're going to bring that small trailer parking out of the watershed to Shaker Lake and bring it back into the site development, as well as a small section in the middle part of the site. And, and Madam Chair, the, the difference between the pre and the post uh, heading to the west is we're about 10 acres less in the post-development condition. Um, and so we wanted to be sensitive to that back line. We wanted to make sure we did not have any paved surfaces heading, uh, heading to the west. Okay, so stormwater management um, intent on a project like this as a designer, we're looking to address both quantity and quality of stormwater. Um, what does that mean? When you pave a piece of property like this, it, it increases the slug of water that's heading downstream. And so we want to make sure that we uh, attenuate that, that we don't create any downstream adverse impacts. And over the past 40 years that I've been practicing, we've, we've learned that stormwater coming off paved surfaces contains um, oils and, and minerals and phosphates and asbestos from brake dust and things like that. And so what we try to do is implement uh, some best <coughs> management practices in our stormwater design to address the quality so that it is um, improved as it's leaving the site to the best of its ability. Um, Val, if, I'm sorry, I've got to ask you to jump back to the overall plan for just one quick second. Okay. Uh, I can read that. <laughs> If you press control plus on the keyboard, it'll make that bigger. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> control plus. Yep. Okay, good. Not working. Okay. Okay. Um, anyway, Jim, back to the red ring? Yeah, the larger scale <coughs> red ring. Sorry. That's all right. I'm going to ask you to bounce around just a, okay. a little bit here. So, uh, agency, our intent with stormwater is to catch our stormwater with curbing and catch basins uh, and that way we can control uh, where runoff goes from the site. Um, in the north part of the site you'll t see two colored areas up there. As I mentioned we've got some trailer parking in those locations. We're proposing uh, two recharge, two infiltration basins in those locations. The soil testing was such that we have deeper deposits of sand in those locations. And we wanted to take that large uh, trailer parking area, put it into a recharge basin, and it, the basin is sized large enough that it can completely store the 100-year event. And we did that in two locations. 
and then any overflow would come back into our drainage system. So we're trying to promote uh, some recharge to be a sediment four bay prior to that recharge area. As we move to the main body of the site, the building, the loading docks, and the employee parking, all that is working uh, by gravity in a southerly direction. And we're proposing two stormwater wetlands, one on the west side of the building and one on the south side of the proposed building. And the um, stormwater wetlands uh, will contain uh, a sediment four bay, it's a large plunge pool uh, at the outlets and uh, it's made you know, with a riprap lining such that uh, it reduces velocities as it comes out of the pipe from the paved surface. This summer is a great example. Connecticut saw some incredibly intense storms. And off of large parking areas, that water is really kind of ripping. And we just don't want to dump it into a, a treatment practice. We want to create a plunge pool and give it, uh, reduce its velocities and give it a little bit of settling of some of the bigger particulate in the storm water. It'll then flow into the constructed storm water. Um, I talked a little <coughs> bit about quantitative attenuation. Uh, what we do, and you, you sometimes you hear the word detention basins, we actually purposely undersize the outlet to these basins <laughs> so that the water can't get through quick enough. It builds itself up and it lets itself down at a desired rate. And if you have enough capacity in your system, then you, you're not increasing the rate downstream, and that's really one of the key goals. So both practices, both stormwater mean, uh, ponds will have uh, outlet controls to them. Um, the basins um, will each contain side slopes that are planted with shrub material. We have uh, shallow marsh areas uh, and we have open water. And so we're essentially creating a, well, we call it a stormwater pond or a stormwater wetland. And then each of these elements, uh, you know, seeks to, to help. Uh, the side slope plantings more naturalize the look of these practices, so it's not a fenced in dug dry basin. Um, the open water, and I'm sorry, the herbaceous materials in the shallow marshes do provide some uptake of some phosphates and nitrates from the stormwater runoff. And so um, <coughs> each of those practices will come together. We have a photo of what we're trying to achieve with these practices. Where is it? Up. Right there. Right. Where's this photo? Next one down. No, right here. It says photos right there. Nope. Let's see. Uh, wait. I'm not sure which one it is. I'm not sure which titles. one it is, but we'll hit it in a minute. Okay. Dalga impact photos. No, nope, that's not it. That's okay, though. That's okay. Um, it's there, but... Madam Chair, to, sa to save time, we have some blow-ups of each of these practices. Mm -hmm. I I'm happy to go through those, but as I just described, they, they, they each the two stormwater wetlands mm -hmm. are, have the same kind of features to them. They measure about five acres in size in total. Mm -hmm. So we're really creating five you know, new acres of, of when complete wetland areas. Oh! oh. Yeah, yeah, we've had good success with um, creating these stormwater basins to really function mm -hmm. nicely as a nice wetland, you know, with this open water component and, uh, um, you know, scrub, shrub emergent um, mm -hmm. bordering on the edges of that. Um, and they can provide, you know, functions for wildlife habitat, yeah. groundwater recharge, nutrient removal, that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, part of the wetlands that are being impacted are just the are the existing stormwater swales. Mm -hmm. So these will certainly replace those functions as well. As, as soon as we can get the software back up, we'll bring in, we have some enlargements of each of those basins. Mm -hmm. um, Scott, maybe you could give a little more detail on the um, wetland planting. If we're able to. Yeah, well, we've got um, 20 species. Let me just wrap up. Yeah. Okay. So I'm almost, I'm almost through, Madam Chair. Um, yes, thank just you. a couple quick items. Um, 
erosion control during construction is important. We don't want the transport of sediment or debris getting into any of the on-site wetlands or, or heaven forbid on any of the abutting properties. So the goal is really to protect those areas. Um, the measures that will be included in our submittal for the P&Z Commission site plan will include um, construction exits so that we're not tracking dirt out to the public ways, silt fences, silt socks, temporary sediment basins, silt sacks at Kess basins, and then of course dust control through the project. Can we not access any No, of we're the so, there's so, I'm not sure why. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. You don't have an actual PowerPoint. We do on some of these, yes, but um, the, the, the uh, orientation and the density of the graphics was so high, PowerPoint was not, um, yeah. That, that's so just an, I think we're good. That's yeah. just an example there of one of the stormwater basins. You'll see the open water yep. in blue, the four bays in white. Scott, why don't you talk a little bit about the wet <clears throat> creation side of this? Yeah, so in, in as I mentioned, there's an open water component, and mm -hmm. then these marsh areas that will be slightly higher in elevation so they can support either a, a shrub community or an emergent plant community. Um, there's, uh, I think we proposed 20 species of, of well, 10 species of woody shrubs and 10 species of herbaceous um, like emergent, um, emergent vegetation and um, sedges and rushes and grasses and those, those sorts of species uh, to be planted in these marsh areas. Um, and then the side slopes will have a, a seed mixture broadcast on them that it's kind of a sort of an eco-tone sort of seed mix. It's one of the Ernst conservation mixes that has um, some sort of upland species, but also a few uh, species that you might find on the edges of wetlands uh, growing within that as well. So, you know, these are all, will function as an actual wetland uh, habitat, wetland plant community. Um, I'm going to wrap up, Madam Chair, with just a description of the impacts. Um, we, we submitted an application that identifies three areas of impact, so mm -hmm. I just want to walk those mm -hmm. through you, and then I'm going to turn it back to, to Scott. Um, the three impact areas, the, the, the first impact area, if you could scroll a little bit to the left, is way up at the north end of the site. Yeah. There we go. So uh, Scott mentioned during the presentation that small isolated wetland in the pocket up near Sh uh, Shaker Lake. Um, we have a 3,200, 35 square foot impact to the regulated area. We're not impacting the wetland and it's really needed to provide access uh, around the building in that location. Impact area B is the farm pond itself. The farm pond measures 9,500 square feet of of wetland impact and 68,835 square feet of impact to the surrounding 100 foot regulated area. And then impact area C contains uh, two wetland impact areas, both to the man-made swales from Hallmark. Uh, and they're in two locations, really just to provide access to the back land. You'll also see uh, regulated area impacts associated with the man-made swale in those locations, um, as well as the, the constructed stormwater pond for the 25 Bacon High Bay building. Um, so sir, 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 right here. No, we're not taking any no, 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 we're not taking no, no, questions no. at this time. Ask questions yet. No, we're not asking chance. questions. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So um, <coughs> that that can be a little louder for Kevin. Yeah, that concludes my presentation, Madam Chair. I'll okay. turn it back to Val and to Scott. Scott. Um, well, I mean, you covered the the impact pretty well. I, I will say, um, you know, the the impact area of the small isolated wetland that is in the existing open mm -hmm. field. There is not um, tree removal around that wetland, right? So. That's just that all, every, everything is contained within the existing limits of the open field area. Um, the the pond, the st wetland, stormwater wetlands are, are designed to, you know, 
ecologically function similar to what's being lost in with with the uh, with the man-made pond in the middle of the field and the other wetland impact closer down to the high bay building um, we do have pictures of those swales if you wanted to see them but they're currently uh, like a grass mode swale right now but they did contain <coughs> hydric soils um, so there's probably some you know treatment associated with that and but those waters will be still treated before they're released into the broader wetland system by going into this uh, into treatment water um, treatment stormwater system A and B and be capturing all of that so the Basically, the these wetland system, stormwater wetland systems are going to function in ecologically similar to what is being lost, and it's really about a ten to one replacement. So, you know, there's a significant amount of wetland area that's being produced um, or created as, as part of this design. And there, there's your there's an example of, of other projects that we've done in the past where. You know, we've created these nice little wetland systems that have a little vegetative buffer, mm -hmm. shrubs, you know, open water, emergent scrub shrub, then maybe a tree component uh, along the uh, upper portions of that. Mm -hmm. Cancel. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's really all I got to say. Okay, okay. Um, do you want to bring up the photos or we'll just do it? What I'd like to do is uh, talk a little bit about alternatives. Mm -hmm. um, I think the best way to depict what we've been doing for the last couple of years is just trying to strike a compromising balance. Um, Avoiding some of the established wetland systems here um, and along here were our target, our primary importance. Mm -hmm. This was the same charge we had when we tried to do 25 bacon, and of course, we had to mitigate those impacts as well. Um, this really is a culmination of over a year and a half of trial and error work through various configurations. Um, I know I was a pain to the development team, especially the one sitting right here. Um, but but we, we tried many configurations, okay? So, aside from the avoidance to the main, the main portion, which some of our original um, access points did impact those types of wetlands, so they really came off the table right at the beginning. Um, but we were constrained, certainly, by the narrowness of the site, mm -hmm. the railroad tracks, of course, the existing building, of course, um, the configuration and the orientation of the wetlands to the, to the uplands, just the way they dendritically developed, mm -hmm. mainly because of the two watersheds. Um, but also, uh, we, we had to give um, consideration uh, to the neighborhoods on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, we really couldn't do it just on wetlands, although we did try, um, but, but we, were, we were concerned about some of the impacts. So once we got over the access and understood that we could bring this in and we could deal with that type of configuration, we started looking at these other orientations, we were looking at other buildings. And I guess the easiest way to explain this is that um, unlike, let's say, office buildings. Mm -hmm. When we lay out office buildings, um, we can sometimes, I've avoided wetlands by moving the employee parking or the parking way over on the other side, and of course, we've got a hike in. But still, we can do it. it it's, it's easy, okay? The only thing is inconveniencing people, and let's be honest, we all need to walk. So, let's take, uh, for example, residential. Residential, we can use ponds as an amenity. You can use wetlands as amenities. You have more flexibility. When you're talking in an industrial zone mm -hmm. with any type of industrial user, you are limited with the types of buildings that those uses can accommodate. And tied to not just building size is also the parking configuration and the orientation from outside the building to inside the building. 
So that meant that we couldn't just come up with a building and plop it on the site and have Adam think that he could even put someone in there. It actually had to have functional utility. Okay. So these are some of the early um, <coughs> configurations. And what I did was I, I highlighted the wetlands that we are trying to avoid. I also highlighted in yellow, these yellow boxes are these areas of significant vegetation, uh, particularly adjacent to the residential areas that we were trying to avoid. So we were actually doing more than wetland avoidance, we were doing resource avoidance. So um, I wanted to show you a couple of these large users because they wanted the site badly. And every time we tried something, we just, we just couldn't make it work. Um, and so we literally had to abandon that market and that, that, that idea. Um, so that factored pretty heavily into what we were doing. Here was another configuration where, you know, we thought, well, we could maybe save this wetland here. We didn't impact it, but it didn't have the connection between the two sites with parking, which, you know, really a lot of users wanted. Um, we tried to skirt a couple of the other wetlands by going around them, and guess what? We put things closer to the neighborhood. So there's constant yin and yang of how to just make this work. Here's another one. Uh, this is a little more detailed, showing the parking and the loading. Um, and as we proceeded through this alternative analysis, you know, we, we did entertain the idea of a smaller building. Okay, this is why I'm trying to say the size doesn't always matter. We, if we avoided the pond by the building size and made the building uh, shorter, in order to accommodate that type of building, the building had to be deeper. That place, every way we did it, the building, we couldn't, frankly, we couldn't really fit it on the site, that's why I don't have one. But it would have cut into here, maybe we would have had a triangle, but this whole area would have been affected just to avoid the, the pond. So what we ended up doing is avoiding this wetland here preserving all of the vegetation around the site and literally threading the needle onto you know what really is already open except for this area here which doesn't contain a wetland and so as i went through this alternative analysis you know i want to share with you some of the thoughts um that you know the buildings over a million square feet were in the greatest demand they still are um, but they resulted in greater wetland impacts, greater resource impacts, and mainly not just because building size, but everything that goes around with it, okay? Single user footprints uh, allowed us to shift the building, but when you get into certain size buildings, 300 to 500, you're in a completely different user. Those users are very, very intensive on the site. They are looking for uh, quite literally a thousand to fourteen hundred vehicles and we just thought that that was not going to work okay um, and obviously as I just mentioned shortening the building also meant that we are going to be breaking into these you know magnificent mature tree stands that we wanted to leave so that came off the table so essentially you know there is no change in footprint size that allows us to avoid the pond because there's specific parking configurations and specific spaces with buildings of specific uses. And so the configuration and the orientation of wetlands just prohibited us from avoiding anything more than we have. But what we did do, and this literally took a year, maybe more, we decided to try a two-tenant building because with Adam's knowledge of the market, we knew that if we brought in two tenants, we had flexibility with parking because the smaller buildings, they didn't have so much truck parking and vehicle parking and things of that sort. And that actually gave us more flexibility than one big 800 square foot building. And we were able to avoid some of the wetlands, reduce some of the wetland impacts, uh, preserve the, the signature vegetation, and we still had to maintain a viable project. So that essentially uh, 
is a summary of how we arrived at the proposal before you and how we examined all Thank you. Okay, so um, that being said, I would like to just summarize by um, reviewing the agency's criteria for evaluating significant activities and your criteria for rendering a decision. Um, I think the application has included a detailed description of regulated wetland soils, as Scott has explained, ecological communities and the like, uh, and the associated wetlands with those habitats. We have described, as you just heard, our explanation of uh, alternatives and found that they do not result in a reduction of impacts. Um, we have demonstrated compliance with local and state erosion and sedimentation guidelines. Uh, we do not believe that there was any staff comments from the town engineer or the like that, that said otherwise. To the greatest extent practical, we have avoided and minimized adverse impacts to wetlands. Uh, where unavoidable, we are mitigating impacts with sedimentation and erosion sedimentation controls. The best management practice to minimize uh, turbidity and siltation sedimentation. And in the end, our impact was reduced to 0 0.33 acres, less than an acre, and that 0 0.33 represents 1% of wetlands. I do have a wetland table to show you, but we can get to that later if there's more. Uh, the irreversible and irretrievable impact really is to the farm pond, and we are compensating through wetland creation. We saw Scott and Jim talk about those two basins. We have four basins, two are stormwater, two are wetland creation. The wetland creation is in a ratio of 10 to 1. Okay? And the type of habitat, open water, marsh area, reflects the loss of habitat um, from, from the, uh, the pond impact. The proposed project will not substantially modify a natural channel or inhibit the natural dynamics of a water course. We can't emphasize that enough. We know we've heard folks say we're flooding, we're, we're going to shunt all of the stormwater from the parking into one of the ponds. We are not. Uh, we're not going to flood the neighborhoods, and you've shown how we are capturing that flow. And of course, the proposed project will not significantly diminish overall wetland and watercourse function and value. Mm -hmm. Okay. With that, the music has come from <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry. I couldn't have timed it better myself. <laughs> Did you get your Oscar? I was expecting a speech or something. <laughs> but that seems like a good time for us to shut up. I'm Thank so you very sorry. much. Oh, don't, don't worry about it. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh yeah. Yep. Uh, let's see. We're going to bring up the site plan just in case we start with that. Okay. Good. So he's good. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, so now, is there any of the agents that would like to make any comments or the staff? Kevin, do you have any comments, questions? Kevin, he questions? Have, he can't hear him. He's on mute. Okay, <laughs> okay, Kevin, do you have any questions? I do have a um, summarized report that I can just briefly go over. Um, the applicants have addressed most of what's on my staff report. Um, I'll just be quick. 
Um, the, the site is stable topography. It's pretty flat. Um, water goes from north to south, kind of avoiding Shaker Pond, I'm sorry, Shaker Lake and Crescent Lake. Um, they delineated the wetlands. They have seven wetlands located on site. Um, their, alter their feasible and alternative analysis shows that this um, proposal is their best proposal going forward. Um, let's see what else I put. They have four main drainage patterns showing minimal impact to overall stormwater flow. And the proposed stormwater system is designed to contain several elements that will collect, convey, recharge, treat, and detain stormwater runoff from development areas. This will protect the wetland systems found on the site, and including protecting adjacent water bodies. They do have proposed ENS control measures, which we saw earlier. And then there was one comment from our engineering department. The proposed stormwater management areas are designed to attenuate the increases in peak runoff from the proposed development. So there is no increase in peak runoff up to the 50 year design storm from the site as required by town regulations. And that is all I have. Thank you. Um, so next on the agenda, we'll ask um, the audience, I have a list here, to give their uh, statements and questions. We'll limit you to just quite a few of these. So. Yeah. Pardon? Um, so we'll give you five minutes uh, to speak. You would have to give your name and address for the record uh, right before you start. And you'll have to come up to that. Well, Georgie? Yep. Are they going to come? Really going to stand because that, they're in the way there. Do you want to read the letter first, or go? Through we'll, do the, we'll do the we'll do the audience. Okay. Oh. Did you have the you have the mic in front of the camera? Yes. Yeah, that is an aerial mic. Maybe. Okay, so if they come up here and speak, yeah. and get up could they, they have to go to that one. Could use this one. Yeah. No, they're going to use that one. Okay, or this one. Can one of you compensate a chair? Sure. You want to slide? I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, maybe mine. slide down. Yeah. So we can. You want a chair? Do you want a chair? Yeah. I, I got one. Oh, she's got a chair. <coughs> Just scoot down a little more, okay, guys? We're going to sit right there. Yeah, I apologize to, to the people uh, and everyone. This meeting was, you know, we had planned this meeting. We were going to meet two weeks ago. And then we, got, we had to delay it to this week because of... Um, getting out the notices and legal pieces of that. So we had to delay it to this week. And unfortunately, the town council bumped us out. We're normally in the town council room for our meetings. But when they have a meeting and they bump us to Tuesdays, we get kicked out. So we ended up in this room. Uh, unfortunately, it's not much we could have done to do about it, but we want to continue on. We are, do have timelines we have to meet for our applications and our application process. So we needed to continue on today. I apologize to everyone for that. Wasn't much we could do about it except keep going. <laughs> so, uh, first person I have, I have three sheets, so I'm just going to start with one, is Allison Cushing, 184 Cottage Road. Yeah, and please make sure you speak to, uh, speak to the topic of in the wetlands only. Allison Cushing, 184 Cottage Road. So I'm glad you have this plan up here so that you can see that the piece that is sticking out the most on the Shaker Pine site, that is my property. So uh, very much impacted by this decision. Um, but first I want to give you a little reason, a little story about how I came to be in front of you today. In 2013, I moved to Enfield because of a work relocation. Although I had been in Enfield many times with work, I did not look into the housing and schooling system, but I did notice the sprawling uh, farmlands that are everywhere that reminded me of growing up in Tennessee. It was not until I found Shaker Pines Lake that I decided to dig my roots and raise my family here, including a five and six year old, to grow in, develop in Enfield and to care about Enfield. Immediately, we took part in the lakeside activities, which included canoeing, swimming, and fishing and which enhanced my children's daily lives and physical activity. Nowadays, it's hard to pull kids away from the screens, but this offered them an alternative and a healthy experience. Honestly, if it hadn't been for the lake, it may not have stayed in Enfield. The unique landscape was the only justification for staying in such a high-tech area. I came from Florida. <laughs> 
Um, caring for this community has hit me personally and is why I took part in joining the Shaker Pines Lake Association Board of Directors. Preserving this great environment is more than just stormwater runoff to me. It is about a way of life. It is seen in many places that these two lakes, both Crescent and Shaker Lake, are unique to the city and we need to preserve those. With the project proposed of the 819,000 square foot facility leads me to concerns about what will happen to this beloved lake during and after the construction and manipulation of the soils. The impact of this size facility nestled between two lakes will impact the land quality, water drain off, and wildlife currently occupying the area. I mean, I brought a calendar in which we do, which will show you the wildlife that lives at Shaker Pines Lake. You see there's lots of activities that's probably posted on our website as well. Um, you can even, I am extending my arm, you're more than welcome to come out to my back deck and look at the property and see this site firsthand if you'd like to come, more than welcome to. This will directly impact me and my family, but most importantly, our quality of life. I fear the disturbance of the soil is too close to my property and could impact the quality of my soil, my drinking water, if I'm planting flowers or I have a vegetable garden, it's all going to be impacted. Also, the impact of contaminants that could possibly leach into the lake, which would deem it unsuitable for swimming, among other activities, thus reducing our quality of life. How will we know what types of impacts, whether positive or negative, will occur without any environmental assessment, a full environmental assessment looking at aging, the time in which um, this impact of the environment and the movement of soils will affect our ecology, our fish, our wildlife, and our ability to utilize the lake to what it was designed for. So I'd like again, I'd like to welcome, to invite you to my home and to see for your own eyes what a great and possible influence this, will, this build will impact the environment at Shaker Pines. Thank you. Um, next is Jeremy Cushing. I hope I'm getting the names right. Okay, he's all set. Uh, Linda. There you go. I <laughs> said your name and address for the record, please. Hi, I'm Linda Ostapoff of 109 Cottage Road. I've lived at Shaker Pines Lake for 28 years, and I am also a member of the Shaker Pines Lake Association Board of Directors. I have listened with interest this evening, and I understand and appreciate, after hearing your presentation, the effort and consideration that has been put into this project. I do have some questions. There's, first of all, I've noticed in the stormwater management study that there are two areas of concern for runoff directly into the lake or onto residents' property. As stated on page eight in the stormwater management study regarding point of analysis Northwest POA NW, and this is a quote, runoff from this area drains in a westerly direction via sheet flow directly into Shaker Pond and its contributing wetlands. I do understand that this is the current condition. This is where they're describing what is currently happening. Regarding the second area called point of analysis W or POAW, the study states that, quoting, runoff from this area drains in a westerly direction via sheet flow directly towards an existing low point located upon the subject property and adjacent to the rear of the single family lots on Cottage Road. In the post-development analysis on page 10, it seems to me that the runoff from POA and W will continue to flow into the lake, including runoff from a parking lot, which I believe that Val has said has been moved in her um, discussion tonight. And water from POAW will continue to flow towards the backyards of residents at Cottage Road. Quoting from page 10, as can be seen on the post-development drainage area mapped, figure five, the post-development drainage condition contains four main drainage patterns that are similar to the pre-development condition. After listening to your presentation, I still believe, um, 
I'm welcome to being corrected if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. that the drainage from those areas will continue to flow into Shaker Pines and into the backyard areas of some of the residents. So I, I do see the plans that you have in place with four banks for the drainage system, but I still believe that it's prudent and reasonable to require capture of water and dispersal away from the lake. Val also mentioned in her presentation tonight the two watersheds and the suburbanization, that's a tough one, that affects our water levels on the lake, which plays into my second point, which is the water that flows into the storm drains on Cottage Road flows directly into our lake. It flows into the storm drains, it comes out pipes into the lake, including a very large pipe that flows directly onto the beachfront at Upper Cottage Lake. So when we're discussing our concerns about runoff, it isn't a little runoff going somewhere. If we have runoff from this project, it is going to go right into the water, right on the beach. The town of Enfield should be very concerned about the possibility of additional water flowing into Shaker Pines Lake. Water from our lake flows out of the spillway into Jawbrook Stream and into the center of town. Our spillway has been overwhelmed during severe storms, even when it is fully open. This has caused flooding in the center of town at Paloma Drive, resulting in the need to close that street. We cannot handle additional water flow into the lake. Our spillway is already in need of, of expensive repairs. There are cracks in the pipe and the concrete apron has to be replaced. Lake residents are already dealing with increased basement flooding and standing water in backyards during heavy rainfalls. In one case this past year, board members needed to help a resident sandbag their property to protect it from the high storm waters. We received help from the town during this incident. Additional flooding will result in hardship to these homeowners and interfere with their reasonable use of their property. You have about a minute. One minute? I'm almost done. <laughs> I believe that it is prudent and feasible to require capture of water and dispersal away from the lake and to require more vegetation to mitigate the flow. I would also ask that the Inland Wetlands and Watercourses Agency make a site visit to the proposed development as well as the surrounding lakes. The size of this project and very limited length of time afforded to us to understand and request mitigation of the serious impact of this project will have on our homes and the habitat of the lake is very concerning. The proximity of this construction to homes and to the lake itself is troubling. It is difficult for us to understand all of the ramifications of the plans being presented as we are not experts. We may need to engage council for assistance to help us understand these issues. This will be a large and profitable project for the owner and we are asking that all possible avenues for mitigating the impact on our residents in the lake environment be carefully and fully explored before proceeding. Did I get in on this Yes, you did. you just did. All right, thank you. <laughs> Uh, Kenneth Hanley, 72 Spruce Homes. Did I say that right? I'm sorry. Keep going. State your name and address for the record, please. Hanley, Kenneth, 72 Spruce Land Road. Uh, a couple questions, basically. Uh, everybody on this side of the street, so to speak, works for Stanley? All you guys got paid by Stanley to do your jobs for this whole water thing? Well, uh, sir, it's not, yeah, we don't answer questions. We just we'll answer them later. Huh. Okay. Sorry. I'm sorry. Wait, no, ask the question. All right, never mind. When, when can I ask questions? Now. 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 They we'll write them down after. and we'll answer them later. They get answered after. They get, get answered after. after. They get answered after. Yeah. Okay. All right, so the first question is who pays your paychecks? Uh, second question everybody on this side works for us, I assume. Uh, was there a high water uh, uh, test done? High uh, no, water table test. What were the PERC test results on the uh, area before the pond? And how are you going to address the runoff for antifreeze, diesel fuel, uh, any other type of tar contaminants that are going to run off the uh, parking lot? And I speak specifically of uh, tractor trailers and other vehicles that come into the area because uh, they do leak 
And I know for a fact I used to work in the business. Uh, the other question I have is when can I uh, voice my opinions about the whole project? Because uh, 72 is on the right side, about four lots up. That's about it. Uh, 179 Cottage, Smith? She declined. She declined? Okay. Next is Al uh, Pushy, maybe? Mm -hmm. 74 Cottage Road? 74 Cottage? <laughs> I apologize for your names. <laughs> Now's your turn. Now's your turn. Now's my turn? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I didn't prepare anything, but all I can say is living uh, on uh, Could you Cottage say your name Road? and address? I, you know, for the record, okay. please. First, say your name and address. I think they could hear me. I'm pretty no, loud. No, no, your name and address. Oh, what? Name and address. Oh. <laughs> Al Pinto, 74 Cottage Pinto. Road. Okay. Okay? You're good to go. All Thank set? You. Okay, yeah. good. Okay, there's one problem that we had two years ago. Is, is that um, whoever owned Hallmark, who I don't even know who owns it today, um, they come down our street, and it's a dead-end street. So we have to back them up, and the street, I believe, is probably almost a mile long. I have backed four tractor trailers 55 minutes backwards because they can't turn around up that end street. Okay. Yeah, that's not in the wetlands, sorry. Okay, now that, but that doesn't mean anything. Yeah. No, no it, it does, sign. but not for this commission. Not for this meeting. Yeah, we this can't. commission is just looking at the wetlands. Yeah, we can't rule on that. That would be for planning and zoning. That would be planning and zoning. You'd have to go to the planning and zoning meeting. Oh, okay, okay. Right, gotcha, okay. Yeah. Now, the other thing is, across from Fermi, they put up that new building, correct? Okay, that, yeah, this is only this property. Yeah, wait, I'm getting? Uh, okay, okay, go you ahead, know, go ahead. I'll tell you what, I feel like I'm on Perry Mason here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Right? I don't, I haven't seen the prints of this building, only what you've seen here, and you can't see it because he was behind us, but I can see how long that is. Mm -hmm. That's got to be... I don't know. I, don't, I have no idea. How, how long is that? Does anybody know? Well, it's in the plans. They, don't they can't answer. Yeah, we don't, we yeah, we don't, don't do back and forth. We don't answers until after. You ask some questions and they get Okay, back. I'll tell you what. I'm done. But anyway, um, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, next is Angela Foss, 16 Crescent Beach. I brought, I know that they uh, had... Your name and address, I'm please. sorry. Your name and address? Yes, I heard you. <laughs> sorry. Angela Foss, 16 Crescent Beach Drive. Thank you. I brought some pictures. I know that they have pictures as well. And they're very similar to theirs, but I wanted to share my pictures with you. Because I pointed out some things that they didn't point out in their pictures. So these all came up from the Win Stanley Enterprises... Um, website or from the town of Enfield website. First of all, in the very first picture you can see, they've got the pictures of what they have built previously and their additional build. And you can also see all the lake roads which are dictated better on this on their little site here on the left and on the right. Mm -hmm. So this is our concern. Our concern is that this is like a big smoke and mirrors um, scene, which means, yes, I see that there are seven or eight little wetlands that they pointed out, which in itself is a serious issue for the wetlands committee, but they're not addressing the fact that we have humongous wetlands on both sides. There are the lakes, and this is what, it's, they're talking about building this giant piece of property, or on the property, giant building in threading a needle in between our beautiful lakes for the town of Enfield. I don't know if you've ever been to Italy, but in Italy they have the Colosseum and all these beautiful things because they kept them and took care of them. They took pride in all their beautiful um, structures. 
here we have two beautiful lakes that we have been gifted as residents of the town of Enfield. We're building a new home on one, my husband and I, and thrilled about being able to build on this, this beautiful lake, being able to look out at the beautiful wildlife, being able to catch fish and all of this. And they're talking about creating these little tiny islands within their property, and they're actually saying things like, they claim they will minimize the impact to our lake over and over again. And if you listen to what they say, it will minimize the impact. So that means they are well aware that there is going to be an impact to our lake. And you guys are too smart for this. To even have gone this far, I'm really surprised that this has even gone this far because they're putting this giant one mil, almost one million square foot building <coughs> cement structure in between two of these beautiful lakes that we have. So it's pretty, to me, it's pretty much black and white. There isn't even any discussion that should be going on here. This is, of course, impacting the wetlands. And the wetlands that are interfered, and that are going, that we're talking about here, that are even, they're talking about, they've discussed. They know their wetlands. So the other pictures I had in here were, um, the picture they have with this, giant amount of um, building space, and the lake is on both sides. And then here is on the back, and there are pictures, even on, on the Italian Benfield website, brown out the lake, and even when you saw the pictures that they show you, they don't even make the lake look like it's water. It kind of like browns it up, so I circled it in red for you to see the impact. Here is the site again down here. Here is the oasis that they're talking about, which is, they say, hand dog. You know, so are both of our lakes. The shakers themselves dug both of our lakes by hand. And then here's this giant piece of land they want to fill with a building. And we have a lake on both left and right of it. It's inconscionable that it would even be something that we would even consider. I and mean, that's the elephant in the room that they're choosing the one spot. And I feel that's on both, what has lakes on both sides. One minute. <laughs> okay? Okay. Give one minute. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thank guys. you very much. And I, I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> is that the, Jeffrey Foss? Yes. Did you ask me? I happen to be related. Yeah, I can't uh, so <laughs> The address for us is 16 Crescent Beach Drive in Enfield. And... I want you to know that I've been in Enfield for 60 years, and I'm 60 years old, my entire life, and my wife the same. We both met in Enfield. Anyway, uh, we've been on Crescent Lake for 37 years. I go back a lot further than most people in the room when it comes to lakes, and I've seen things that these people have never seen. Uh, I'm going to ask a quick question. I know no one's supposed to answer this, so I'm just going to ask people to raise your hand if you've ever seen a bald-headed eagle on our lakes, ever. Anybody? Oh, everybody in the room has. Okay, so. Bald-headed eagles are, are uh, an extinct bird that's uh, very important. We have three of them on our lake. I can, I can show you videos right now of them. The only reason why I'm building a beautiful house on the lake is because of the bald-headed eagles. Now, if they mess with our, our system, our ecosystem, the bald-headed eagles will either die or leave the area. We also have blue herring. We got, there's a lot of beautiful birds. One lady spoke. Uh, she had a, pa a pamphlet, but she didn't go into it. These, are, these birds are a huge asset to the United States. Everybody knows this. So I also want to go on and say that one thing that hasn't been mentioned here is this is, uh, our lake is fed by underground springs. No one has said anything about the springs in the ground. Everybody's talking about the surface water. The surface water will be terrible when you place something that large and, and I know they want to displace the water to other places, but guess, guess what? If you displace that water to other places, what happens to our underground springs? Our lake is spring-fed. I know because I swim in it. There are cold spots you hit as you're, dry, as, you're, as you're swimming through the lake. It comes up from the bottom. If you take that large field and cover it with a hard surface, all of the water that filters naturally through the farmland, which I personally have driven with snowmobiles years ago before it was even developed and the oasis that they're talking about that they say is nothing and we can cover it up 
has animals living in it. I've seen the eagles out in that oasis. Now, no one, no one in this room has been around for 36 years to see that. But my daughter, who grew up on the lake, and I have ridden snowmobiles out there and watched the eagles on the oasis that they're talking about. It's not a pond. It's an underground spring, and that's the reason why the farmer who used it had an abundance of water, because the water comes up from the ground. Where does the water come from? The surface. The surface filters the water down through the spring, and this is what feeds our lakes. Take away that, that surface area and, and take away all our water source, and guess what? Our lake dies, and so does not all the creatures that live on it. The bald-headed eagles. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to give you a video if you want to see it. It's on my phone. I watch them all the time. They go in there and they go fishing right in my backyard. So I, my point here is um, raise your hand one more time if you've seen a bald-headed eagle on the lake. And they're, uh, that's my point right there. It, there's just, this is wrong. If this happens, we'll lose our source of water that feeds our lakes and it will kill the bald-headed eagles. Here they are. There's pictures here of it. So just so you know. There's blue herring in here. We got bald headed eagles. It's just these are pictures that we took of our own lake. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Next is Ian Michael Ostafosh. I decline. Okay. Uh, Samantha Weber. State your name and address for the record, please. My name is Samantha Weber. I live at 20 Cranberry Hollow. Uh, I moved to the area in 2020, uh, had the privilege of buying my own home, moving from Springfield. Um, I've grown up in New England my whole life, and anybody who's lived in New England knows that we have the privilege of having a variety of ecosystems and species and wildlife, not only in New England, but as uh, Mr. Foss mentioned, in our community. I chose the neighborhood due to the quiet, laid back lake lifestyle and the environment that reminded me of summers in New Hampshire with my family as a child or afternoons out fishing with my late grandfather. In the year and a half that I've lived here, I've had the pleasure of meeting a number of residents and their dogs, some of whom have lived in the area for several generations. I have been shocked at the variety of wildlife in the area. You don't see that in Springfield. I've gotten used to falling asleep to the sounds of crickets and frogs rather than sirens and engines, and have enjoyed taking uh, my lunch breaks while I work from home, going out and biking or walking around Shaker Pines Lake. I've always enjoyed seeing the kids out swimming, fishing, or even just this afternoon out playing hockey on the pond. When I purchased the property, I had as many young new home buyers like myself do, I had thought about the possibility of eventually raising children in the neighborhood. For now, it's just gonna be my, my cats watching the birds on the porch, but there's plenty of those to go around. It seems these days that another warehouse, high rise, or box store is appearing on any street corner every other week. But at what cost? I appreciate the possibility of job creation for our area, but I'm concerned about the permanent, lasting environmental effect of another massive concrete monstrosity <coughs> and its parking lot dropped in the middle of two large bodies of water such as Shaker Pines and Crescent Lake. What is the impact on the fish, the insects, the birds, and the other wildlife? We need to protect the flora and fauna and the ecosystems that they live in. I, along with the human members of the Shaker Pines and Crescent Lake communities, ask you, I beg you, to consider the impact of this development on the lakes and the homes of the furred, scale, and feathered residents of our community who are unable to be here tonight to speak for themselves. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Next, next we have Randy Daigle, 55 Cottage. Yeah, state your name and address for the record, please. Good evening. 
again. <clears throat> My name is Randy Daigle. I'm at 55 Cottage Road. Um, one of my main concerns, um, as this gentleman just touched upon, um, as on the first page as I handed out is what probably was submitted regarding to show the, the um, water source, the water, the, the two lakes, Crescent Lake and Shaker Pines Lake. But if you flip over to the other, second, third, and maybe the fourth page, that little area that was called a pond, I also uh, went back these are these are called GSI maps, which you guys are familiar with, and this is what should have been submitted when they submitted, not not the first page. I also went back to 1935 and 1950, and that little area, which is they're calling as an oasis, a little wetlands, was a much larger. Um, currently, it's about 25 yards wide by 35 to 40 yards long, um, and it does have catfish in it, and it does have probably other little tiny fish. I know there's a lot of bullfrogs and stuff. But as the gentleman from Acon stated, that water never dries up. One of the main reasons why that water never dries up because it's not just spring fed, that entire farm is what's called an aquifer. All the water that is fed to these lakes are being provided by that farmland. Now as shown on their drawings, they show this little tiny little red line that was their, you know, the, uh, they're calling the watershed line. It's not a little line that goes through the property. There's thousands of underground streams that go into this thing, and that's why it's called an aquifer. One of the major problems that's happening now in California with mass development is that the most common air, the most common reasons why lakes, streams, wells, ponds, and everything else dries up because they're, the most common is impervious paved surfaces that prevent the precipitation from reaching the groundwater. So the, right now, the entire farm is an aquifer, aquifer. So they find, naturally find their ways down to Shaker Pines and, Sh and Crescent Lake. By them restricting it, by 90% of this lot being pavement or building, and redirecting the water to these holding areas, you are now preventing these two lakes from being fed. We are not saying these things can dry up. I'm saying these things will dry up in a matter of time. If there's no water source, and if you were to enlarge every photo that they showed of the property, you go another five to 20 yards up, acres up, there's no stream. These aren't stream fed. These are 100% spring fed by aquifer. If the water doesn't go down through the ground into these natural channels, these two lakes will dry up. There is no question about it. I'm with the state of Connecticut. I oversee the construction of all state facilities, um, commercial, education, judicial, corrections. And before that, I had my own architecture firm that specialized in commercial and industri industries. That is one of the major problems that is happening out in California. And you're sure how it's gonna, it's gonna happen here in Enfield if this thing gets built. Uh, I, they're a good company. I, I've known this, these companies. This is not the site for this building and not the size for this site. You're inhibiting the water flow. Um, and the biggest problem too is if you do contain these waters in these little water containing areas, once it's got some, it's got to go somewhere. So there's a not enough vegetation. The AECOM can spare to this too. There's not enough vegetation that can make this water pure again. The only way, if this contaminates either one of these lakes, is to do what's called air spurging. You literally have to pump air into the ground and dissipate the water with air. So therefore, you have to dry up both lakes, pump natural air into the surface, into the, into the soil, and then clean the, the water, and then pump it back in. There is no way of cleaning water in, in these aquifers other than that way. It's, it's it, again, they're a good company. This is not the site. There's plenty of other sites that this massive building can be done. This farmland is 100% an aquifer. There is no dispute in it. Um, again, that little oasis that they call, they like to call wetlands and downplay it, that is also, that was a much larger, larger pond area. Um, it could have been man-made, but I doubt it because it was in the 1930. I went back to 1932, and that light that was probably four times the size it was it is now. That they probably enclosed it to get additional farmland because now you could produce and make money. 
you can't cover it. It's going to constantly flood it. So I, I highly ask the town of Enfield to look further into this. Do whatever investigation you can to determine this, the act you feel, the results of it. Please be reassured. This is not if, it's when. If this gets built up, these two lakes at some point will dry up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dagle. Is it Stacy Dagle? Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, Cheryl Cody? Yep. 92 Cottage? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Put your name and address for the record, please. Absolutely. My name is Cheryl Cody, 92 Cottage Road, Enfield. And first, I want to thank you for having this meeting here today, for allowing the public to speak. I think it's extremely important, but I don't want to take up too much time with that, so <laughs> I want to get right to it. Um, so, first, I want to ask uh, some questions about the proposed uh, storm water management system. We understand that the applicant agreed that the runoff would contain contaminants including suspended soils, petroleum bicarbons, nutrients, heavy metals, and salt. This is an agreement. They also agreed that they would have adverse effects on the lakes if that was to go into the water. So, the proposed dips, too much, it's hot. The proposed system is a sediment bays and infiltration basin basin which my understanding means simply a ditch I'm concerned that the sediment can seep into the ground if a rock base is used or if a cement base is used what happens if that cracks what is the failsafe for either of these projections how would the dewatering process work how will the regular maintenance be managed these are all these questions that I have mm -hmm. currently. Some additional concerns are the sediment that may contain potentially cancer-causing agents, including heavy metals, as mentioned before. We know <coughs> what diesel fuel contains. We know what these, um, these uh, surfaces uh, will slide in. I'm not an expert. I am just a person who is concerned. And when I think about it, I can't imagine that all the contaminants will flow through the system. I cannot imagine that nothing will not flow into our waterways. So it, it just, when we have heavy rainstorms, icing, thawing, icing, how will that be contained? How will that not seep into our waterways, into our lakes? How is that gonna happen? How, what is our fail safe? I'm concerned whatever measure is taken is not a fail safe and there will be contaminants in the lake. If that was to happen, how would we all feel? There's no going back. You can't fix the lake. Unless what Randy says, take the, all the water out, take every, and then put it all back in. That's the only way to fix it. It's not then a usable lake. So from a personal level, I'm very concerned because this is going to change our whole lifestyle at our lake. I've lived here for over 30 years. My grandchildren swim in this lake. If there were ever, ever contaminants, because who is going to police this? And if there are contaminants in the lake, and my granddaughter or my one of my grandchildren swam in that lake, got sick, got cancer from these contaminants, how, I'm sorry, I'm just getting a little emotional. I'm wondering if there's an alternative. And as Randy had mentioned, either a different site, um, even the diversion of the water, I'm not sure that's going to be a sufficient uh, resolution, but potentially diverting all of that water that they're going to put into these basins instead of putting them into the ground, which we know will end up, as a spring-fed lake, will end up into the lake. Um, there's just one additional item, maybe more, um, that I'd like to bring up to see if there was a soil assessment completed. I know they checked the soil, but did they check the soil for contaminants? These were farmers. There are chemicals in that soil. Are those cancer-causing uh, agents in that soil that they're going to be digging up 
like asbestos, right? If you leave it alone, it's fine. If you dig it up, we all get cancer. That's essentially it. <laughs> um, but I do um, appreciate everything uh, allowing us to speak here tonight. And I just want to leave you with one thing. Can we say with 100% certainty that our lake is not going to be affected by this? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I was just told the town council chamber room is available, that we could move upstairs if we like. If we want to take a five minute break, we could all yep. make everybody more comfortable. Or do you want to stay here? Stay. Stay? Okay, we'll stay. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Do you want to stay? I don't care. What's the commission want to do? Hey, who, who wants to stay? Raise your hand. Who wants to leave? No more complaining that you can't hear. Okay, we'll stay. <laughs> thank you very much for checking, though. Yes, thank you for checking. <clears throat> Next is Paul Cody. All good. All good. Patricia Holden. Good evening, Patricia Holden, 67 West Shore Drive. Good evening. Um, I don't have anything prepared to say, but I do want to add my voice to a concerned resident. I have lived at Shaker Pines Lake for 60 years. That's all of them. And I <laughs> hate to admit that, <laughs> age wise. Um, I'm very concerned about the lakes being able to continue to live. I'm concerned about the wildlife and all of the wetlands out there. I hope that you take into consideration all of that. I have nothing against this company at all. I understand people need to have businesses, but I don't think the lake area is the right place to have it. And once we lose our lake, we won't have it back. And I don't think that Enfield has an overabundance of lakes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maureen Butler? 69 West Shore? Yeah. Hi, Maureen Butler, 69 West Shore Drive. I too have lived uh, 64 years at Shaker okay. Pines Lake, and I am appalled at the idea of such a massive building in the location that it is. I am so pleased to hear the neighborhood concern for the wildlife, the, re the wetlands being left alone. I look to the wetlands committee to preserve the wetlands we have, not to accept proposals that uh, manipulate wetlands with engineering techniques. They may or they may not be good. I'm not an engineer. But the neighborhood I live in, I want the, the, the wetlands, the, the surrounding area to remain relatively the same. Um, and I support everything that any one of the residents here have said before me. They are much more well prepared than I am because I'm just coming into this brand new this past week. Thank you. Thank you. Liz Werner, 74 West Shore. Hi, I'm Liz Werner, and 74 West Shore. Hi. And I, everyone here is so much more pre well prepared and uh, really presenting what we all need to hear about this. I just have a few questions. Um, I hear a lot about catchments. I don't hear a lot about like how that is going to get removed, how these poisons are going to be removed. Um, I'd al I also heard that um, there was some wetlands that was donated to the town. Is that, uh, is that correct? No? Okay, I, I, yeah, I it's hard to well. hear back there what, what's yes. going on. Um, I'd like to know that if this project or some similar project were to go through, 
is when families want to take responsibility for our homes, the value of our homes, the, if there's flooding, if the lakes are lost. So thank you very much for having this and having us have our say. Thank you. Thank you. Stephanie Quayle. Um, I live at 62 Cottage Road, um, and I've been living on the lakes my whole life. I grew up on Crescent Lake and bought my home with my husband and children about eight years ago. I know nothing else besides living on the lakes. Obviously, I'm very passionate about protecting the lakes and the wildlife surrounding them. The damage that this building will do to the aquatics of the lakes will not happen overnight, but it will definitely happen over time. Industrial runoff can contain heavy metals like lead and mercury, which can find their way into the food chain. This can cause illness or death to fish, other animals, or even humans that consume them. Sediment washed away from construction activities and urban activity under lakes, reducing water clarity and water quality, and can be lethal to aquatic organisms by becoming trapped in gills. Finally, as atmospheric pollutants from truck exhaust pipes or industrial power generation can enter <coughs> lakes as acid rain or other forms of acidic precipitation. There are many forms of wildlife that live back there on that land. Deer, coyotes, turkey, foxes, bobcat, and eagles, to name a few, all play into the food chain that all thrive off of each other. I remember catching bullfrogs in the oasis as a kid, and now they want to just fill it in and plop a building right on top. The lake residents pay flood insurance and lake tax to help keep the lakes healthy. The lake tax goes towards testing and keeping the water safe for the aquatic, wildlife, and safe to swim in. We pay extra to live here. How would it be fair if a huge building is built in our backyards and the lakes slowly start to die over time? I lived in Enfield for my whole 33 years of life. Every little patch of woods and land has slowly disappeared around me. Buildings go up and go abandoned shortly after. Well, then just move away, you say? I can't. My parents and siblings also arrive here, reside here on these lakes along with friends and neighbors I've, mo I've known most of my life. I was very fortunate to live by these lakes and to have this last patch, patch of land of Enfield to enjoy with my children and maybe one day grandchildren. Now with this building being built, there will be no more patches of land left in Enfield. Please take into consideration that there are plenty of open areas that are not near wetlands and wouldn't face the catastrophic devastation that this area will suffer from. There's also plenty of abandoned buildings nearby that would benefit from being restored. Please help us preserve the history and beauty of Shaker Pines and Crescent Lake for our future generations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, River, I don't know the um, last His one. phone died, and he had his notes on the phone like I did. So if anybody has an iPhone charger, that would just plug that in, because he has some really good points. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so we'll bump him until we get back to you Okay. Uh, Sherry Jackson, 119 Cottage. Hi, I'm Sherry Jackson, 119 Cottage Road. Good evening. Many residents such as myself have chosen to live around Shaker Pines Lake due to the tranquil surroundings that the lake provides. We care for and care about <coughs> <excuse> me, <coughs> our community. Particularly, we care about the water quality of our beautiful lake. As concerns about water quality continue to be highlighted in our country, we no longer take clean water for granted. That is why I'm here today. When I first heard about the proposed Wynn Stanley Enterprises gaining access to property on Bacon Road, I became very concerned about how this would affect our lake. As a resident, I would like to express my thoughts and share my concerns. I ask for your consideration as you make decisions on behalf of those who will be closely affected by dam any damage that can occur to our waterways with such a large scale project. In an article in the South Side Weekly on February 2021, Chicago residents were concerned about an addition of a similar large-scale project in their area. <clears throat> in this article, they discussed that the warehouse would be in operation 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so hundreds of vehicles would pass through at all hours, 
the highest truck volume during the night and evening and early morning. On a peak day, more than 600 commercial vehicles, including 42 semi-trucks, 421 delivery vans, would drive in and out of the facility according to the traffic study that they did. You need Car to stick to one more. I am. Okay. Okay. Let good. me have this connection. <laughs> the carbon footprint or total amount of greenhouse gases that <clears throat> just one of these trucks creates is the same as that of 14 people. These gases include carbon monoxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and fluorinated gases. The increase in vehicle exhaust, particulate matter, including asbestos, in the air from truck wheels, diesel exhaust, and toxic compounds will surely contaminate water runoff. These gases and particles from the large vehicles can affect human health and cause severe damage to our waterways and find their way into our pristine lake. They will have a harmful environmental impact to say the least. According to McClare Law's website, every 15 minutes a person is killed or seriously injured in an accident by a tractor trailer. Again, I'm going to get there. <laughs> Big rigs or semi-trucks around 500,000 trucking accidents occur every year. 68% of all fatal truck accidents happen in rural regions. 74% of all passenger vehicle fatalities include a large truck. Again, we need to... I'm getting there, I promise. It's just hanging there with me. It's just wetlands, though. It's just wetlands. Yeah, I'm getting to the wetlands, but i got to give you this first. Okay. I got it. More than half of these accidents occur during the day. Large trucks are more likely to be involved in fatal and multi-vehicle crashes than passenger vehicles. These accidents sometimes lead to the spread of hazardous materials and compounds to the environment. Liquid spills, diesel fuel, and motor oil sometimes leave the paved, paved road, roads and infiltrate the surrounding waterways. Chemicals used to fight vehicle fires are also harmful to the environment, to our waterways, wells, and groundwater. Additionally, these accidents will result in loss of life, overtax our police department and fire departments, further causing a burden to the residents of Enfield and endangering their lives and their safety. From what I also understand, this type of traffic will degrade our road rates exponentially. The traffic in that is not a park concern. I'm getting there again. <laughs> you got to be But no, we can't. No, just, just skip over to the park. The degradation yeah. will, will, I guess. Skip that skip piece and just part. go to the wetlands part, please. Okay, hold on. Thank you. Uh, the construction materials that will that will be used to keep up the necessary road construction will result in the de deposition of sediment that can that can smother aquatic habitat and clog our waterways. Due to the limited time allowed, I was able to simply highlight my main concerns regarding this large-scale project. I'm hopeful that the members who are present here this evening have the same values when it comes to protecting Shaker Pine Lake and all of the waterways in the town of Enfield. Please do not, not allow the monetary gain to supersede the environmental impact of such a large-scale pro project, especially when, it, when this company has already a very large presence in, ta in the town of Enfield and has made a significant environmental impact. Thank you for your time and your attention. I do have one question. I'm wondering if an environmental impact statement was done for this project. If so, can you please provide the location of this information? Again, I respectfully thank you for your time. Thank you. Lori <laughs> Parker, 105, Cottage Road. Please, 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 please. Good evening, Lori Parker, 105, Cottage Road. Just some background to my interest in this area. My grandparents moved here in 1955 and built several houses. Myself, daughter, and grandchildren now live in some of these houses, bringing five generations to this beautiful area. We grew up swimming, fishing, and exploring the lake. My mother used to bathe me in it. <laughs> I am asking the commission to take their time to please table, as this is a large project, and the materials were just submitted last month. Um, the developer just made the presentation tonight. Um, we have a lot to digest here. This project will greatly impact this unique area as Shaker and Crescent are the only lakes in Enfield, as well as being located in a Shaker historical area. Of great concern is the impact on the lakes and farm pond. In regards to the lakes, the drainage warrants further research. There appears to be one sediment floor bay and small ditch to capture the runoff in stormwater area D. Along with flooding, there's also contamination issues to consider. 
Flooding has been an issue with great amounts of rain that floods our basements if we don't open our spillway in time. And then when we do open it, we flood those downstream Freshwater Boulevard. This concerns not only our area, but the whole side of town the lakes flow into. Is the small sediment bay sufficient? Contamination is another great concern as those fields are active farmland and have been treated with pesticides for as long as I can remember. I'm sure you are aware of cancer causing dieldrin found in the fields down the road at the former Fermi High School and the issues that arose there. We really need to have soil composition testing to determine what is in these soils as well as address what new pollutants will be added from parking lot and building pollutants, construction and petroleum runoff, and oil slicks, as all of it could run into the lakes and affect children, pets, gardens, food sources, and fish. With the increase of runoff, we increase the chances for these contaminants to flow into the lake. And once it is contaminated, it would take years to undo. My grandchildren swim in this lake. I float in it. There is also concern for fish and vegetation. We brought special grass carp from down south to naturally treat the lake. We also spend a lot of money on chemical treatment, which if we need to open the gate more often, we're flushing it away and possibly risking contaminating the special fish. All of the documentation I have read so far addresses surface water flow. What about the groundwater, springs, and underground flow? How is that being addressed? There are impacts to the springs that feed the lakes and the wells residents still use. We need to ensure the water is captured and or dispersed away from the lakes, surface as well as underground water. This assurance needs to be long-term as the detention basins can crack over time and pollutants can seep through. It may take years before that occurs, but how can we be assured that this will be managed into the future? I'm asking that the commission request studies need to be done to make sure no water from this development flows into the lakes. Along with the subject of underground flow is the farm pond identified as wetland three. This pond has been there almost 80 years that I know of. And although man made, it appears to be some type of groundwater seep. And once it was excavated, there has always been water there, even during the driest periods when other ponds like St. Martha's were completely dried up. Give a minute, Lori. Yeah. I understand the Army Corps of determination they have no jurisdiction due to no overground water flow but there must be agencies that have jurisdiction over spring fed ponds or ground regulation groundwater regulations that oversee these types of ponds as we don't know the source of water we really need to ask for a hydroanalysis of this area I also realize it's not deemed a vernal pool because it's not seasonal but permanent but I can tell you there's life in that pond. There's seasonal nesting and breeding in that pond. You can hear the peepers so loud from the abutting houses right in the backyard. Another important concern to our area is prior projects and permit applications for treating the lake has been noted, noted by DEP National Diversity Database. There are records of the Noctowood moth and the endangered dwarf bulrush plant in this area as Shaker Pines is considered to be one of the last viable habitats in the state. I have some of the letters from prior projects. There should be some analysis from the DEP Wildlife Division. Where your time's up? That's it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, we can come around again after if there's time. Um, Sean from 26 Westview. He declined. He declined. Leslie Cunningham, 26 Wheeler. Yes. Leslie Cunningham. Um, I have her letter. I have her letter. Will you be reading her letter out loud? Yes. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, it's part of her packet. Okay. Uh, Chris Renaud. To Jewel Street. Uh, Chris Reno, to Jewel Street. 
Yeah. Sorry about saying your name. What's the address, Two Jewel Street, J E W E L. So, I didn't prepare anything. I just made some notes in the back. Uh, according to the state's website, this agency plays a vital role in protecting our natural resources and in shaping our state's landscape. Uh, if protecting natural resources, wetlands, and endangered species uh, that can't advocate for themselves is the role of this agency or committee, it should be clear that this project proposed cannot be allowed to move forward. Uh, just going back to some of the, the images that were on the screen, um, the, the cross docking was mentioned. Um, so tractor trailers facing wetlands on both sides um, would entail major uh, traffic, which would be destructive to the animal species living and using those wetland areas. Uh, oh, and, and I know that the, I guess the oasis, is, or that land is in the middle, I think, mm -hmm. little pond area, I'm not too familiar with that, but uh, I know people were saying there's green frogs and bullfrogs, um, but I, I didn't hear anyone say that there's definitively no endangered species that reside there. Um, so various salamanders, um, fox turtles, spotted turtles, wood turtles, fog turtles, all of these native to Connecticut um, that are protected and they can't help themselves. So uh, I think this is something that this agency should consider. Uh, proposed runoff wetlands sound nice, but if you kill off what's already living there, it doesn't really matter if you put back wetlands at a 10 to one ratio, if the wildlife there is already dead. Um, and I understand the limitations that the applicant has as a developer uh, with warehouse or industrial buildings, but the local wetlands and wildlife shouldn't suffer and die just because it's harder to make uh, a profit putting in a building on land in between two lakes and wetlands. Uh, so that's all I really have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nancy Martin. Nancy Martin, 27 Crescent. Nancy Martin, 27 Crescent Beach Drive. I'm not going to keep you long. Um, I think from what we see here, the presence of the people as a lifelong resident of Crescent Lake, um, I just want you to take this into consideration, the impact. I understand the goal, but the goal does not fit into our neighborhood. It's unfortunate. It sounds like they've spent an inordinate amount of time trying to fit a square peg in a round hole, taking a year and a half to consider how it's not going to impact wetlands is most concerning. They've gone out of their way to spend the time to see how it's going to work, but we can see from information that people have shared tonight and from the schematics, whatever you want to call them, maps, that it will impact our wetlands. Um, sir, you yourself said, when you said that you would take the five acres and turn them into um, you know, new wetlands, as you call it, uh, that it seems to help. It's my opinion that what seems to help is that we keep our already existing wetlands intact. Yeah. 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 Uh, Jessica Duger, 101 Cotton Trail. Jessica, 101 Cotton Trail. Hi, Jessica Duger, 101 Cottage Road. Um, I don't have any prepared statement either. I've just been um, talking to people about this for as long as we've known about it, listening to everybody's arguments tonight. So what I'm hearing is a lot of assurances that we're going to develop property that is safe and we're going to protect this and, you know, we're going to take care of the runoff water here. 
So from what I'm hearing from everybody else and all of their amazing research that they've done is that there are myriad ways that our properties, our lake, our, our wildlife habitats are going to be ruined. Whether it's major, whether it's minor, we're going to be affected negatively. So I'm hearing assurances, but there is no insurance. Who is gonna take care of the problems for us as they arise? If we get our basements flooded more frequently, there is no insurance policy coming from this company saying we're gonna help you out with that because it's our building that could cause that. If we have problems with pollutants in our lakes, I don't hear that there's any like insurance coming from them saying, well, don't worry about it because we're gonna take care of your lake and we're gonna pay for that. Um, I don't hear anybody saying, we're gonna work to protect the wildlife. I don't hear any of that. We're gonna, we're gonna work to try and stave off any problems is what I'm hearing, but it doesn't sound like that's gonna be nearly enough. And who's paying the insurance bill for all of us when we have no lake left? Are they gonna be the ones that drop the water back in? I want some insurance if you're gonna allow them to come into our neighborhoods and potentially ruin lakes on either side. They're not a good fit. I know you volunteer. I know you put in a lot of time. I know your hearts are in this. You're here to protect the wetlands, right? So please go through every channel that you have to. Call any agency that you have to for backup, for reports, for testing. Please work on our behalf. Call us for help if you need us because we'll help you if you need us to. Um, but please help us save our lakes and our homes and our environment. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, is there a Jeff? Jeff Dugan, 100 Cottage? What's up? Um, we can go back to River. Yeah, go back to River. State your name and address. Uh, my name is River, and my address is 62 Cottage Road. And uh, I've been living on Shaker Pine, uh, Shaker Pine Lake for almost my whole entire life. On these lakes, fishing is my favorite thing to do. I always go fishing all year long. And when I can, I go ice fishing, ice skating, and even swim in both Crescent and Shaker Lake. Another reason I would be really sad is because there are so many creatures and animals that have been roaming these fields for longer than all of us have been alive. Keeping these animals alive means so much to me. We're all, um, where are all the creatures and animals supposed to live? You're just going to build a big building that will soon, that will soon probably be another um, abandoned, I mean, another unused building. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else that wanted to speak that did not sign up? Yeah. Could you state your name and address for the record, please? Hi, uh, my name is Chase. I live on 7 Edgewood Drive. Chase, Chase what's your last name? Pebble, P-I-E-P-U-L. Um, I think what's kind of funny is I actually live on the opposite side of town. Uh, I'm actually only here because my girlfriend, uh, her grandmother lived there. And my friend Abby lives on Crescent Lake as well. Uh, I may understand that some of my questions can't be answered, but I figured I would just express them anyways. Um, wildlife. I may understand that it's not relatively on the same line of wetlands, but when you have such a big industrial building, what about the sound? That is still something that occurs <coughs> with, you know, trucks going, cars going, any of that sort. Um, sorry, I'm a little nervous. I didn't really have a lot of, uh, I didn't have a lot prepared for this. So I'm like You're totally, fine. I'm totally new to this. Um, I just see the passion behind these people and it's just, it amazes me how much they uh, have prepared for this. As well as traffic, I know that's another thing too. How does that affect, you know, the water and even just the wildlife around the area as well? That's kind of all I have to really put out. It's just more about sound. That's a big thing that goes on with that. And I guess the last thing too is what does this do to benefit anyone but the company that's trying to build here? 
why are they coming there? Why can't they go somewhere else? Why did they have to be bottlenecked between two, you know, big, large water sources, you know? It's just odd to me that this is the location that they have to pick. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Can I get your hand? Uh, say that again. Can I get your address again? Yeah, 7 Edgewood Drive. 7 Edgewood, okay. Uh, it's actually by the Enfield Market. It's oh, no, that's fine, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> it's by the other side of town. Again, I just wanted to at least be able to voice that. No, no, you're fine, you're fine. I just need to write it down. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, like, is there anybody else who needed to speak? Can I speak one more time? I've already spoke. Just briefly. Don't listen for the first round. Yeah, I'm looking for the first round. Somebody right there. Hello. Hi. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Mariah Genta, 37 Cottage Road. So I um, I located to Enfield um, 10 years ago. Uh, ended up renting on the Shaker Pines Lake um, in a sort of you know random event and grew to love all of my community members. And the lake itself is so beautiful and so special that that's what kept us in the neighborhood. So that's what kept us in town. And um, my children have grown up on the lake uh, their entire lives. So I have a 10-year-old and a 7-year-old who live on the lakefront side of the lake, so they swim almost every day, every summer, and I'm very concerned about the quality of the water, the pollution risk that everyone else has mentioned, a lot of other folks have mentioned, and one question I have, as others have brought up, is how is the health of the water going to be regulated? So who does that fall on? Is that Wayne Stanley who will take on checking the water, and what pollutants will be checked for, and what will happen if something is found. Does that fall on the town? Is that going to fall on us? Um, so that is one big question I have. I also happen to live on the lowest property on the lake, which is the sandbag home that was referenced in one of the earlier comments, um, the water was touching the foundation of my home this summer, which was the highest it's ever been since we've lived there. Um, so that's also another concern. And also touched on previously, I would look to the board to seek out independent analysis, um, seek out an environmental impact study, a you know, stormwater study that's independent of Wayne Stanley, just so that we can trust the information is accurate and how to best you know, be educated and prepared for what might happen long term. So thank you very much. Thank you. That. Is there anybody else who wanted to speak for the first time? Hi, it's Stacy Daigle, 55 Cottage Road. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to reiterate we have more than the animals that they set aside. Um, the 30 turkeys in my yard um, that come over from there, where are they going to go? that I love to take pictures and videos of. Um, the deer that we go and look at all the time, every time we go down Bacon Road, um, where are they gonna go? And like the last two people said um, about the assurances, we'd really like some assurances that none of these things that these people have brought up are going to happen to our lake. That's our home where we plan on staying for the rest of our lives. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Just a point of interest, John Zepsky, 33 Cottage Road. I live along the spillway. And uh, rather interesting that, uh, I just wanted to point this out. I, I built a house about 15 years ago uh, by the spillway. I'm in a floodplain, floodway area, and the house is probably the only house that's built on piers because of the fact that I'm in that sort of an area. So it would be rather interesting if uh, this construction does progress. Um, will somebody stipulate that this has to be on piers, such as my construction? But that, I just thought I'd throw that out because I'm the only one on piers at, at the, on the lake, and there was reason for that because I'm in a floodplain, floodway area. Thank you. Thank you. Did you speak first? You already spoke once, right? Yeah. Anybody else want to go once? Right. Randy Dago, 55 Cottage Road. Um, regarding, you know, they're a smart company. They're not asking for waivers. They're not looking for deviance. They're, they're doing all the setbacks. They're actually going beyond what's asked for them. Is there any way that the town can ask for some type of a multi-million dollar insurance policy from them that if does if the lakes do get contaminated, that it's not the homeowners that are going to be paying for it. Right now, we pay to treat the lakes for different types of plants. But if, if, if these wells, people are still on wells. If the wells get contaminated or the wells get dried up, it's under their, it's their costs. And, and you don't have specific insurance that covers that stuff. Is there any way that the town can require Win Stanley to provide a multi, multi-million dollar insurance policy that if any unforeseen do occur, at least we know it's not gonna be on our, our dollar. That's something I really ask for. Thank you. Thank you. Back again, Jeff Foss, 16 Crescent Beach Drive, Enfield. So I'm all about numbers, and I realized there was a number that's missing here tonight. Um, I happen to be the largest taxpayer in the town of Enfield for residential property. I have been for many years. Also the town of Summers, but that doesn't matter. Anyway, um, the thing that never got mentioned here is how many homes are going to be impacted. And Crescent Lake has 100 homes, and Shaker Pines Lake has 400 homes. There's 500 people involved here. I just want to make sure that's clear, and I would like the council to stop this from happening. Thank you. Do you have anybody else? Anybody else want to say anything? One last time, did anybody else want to speak again? Okay, seeing none, we'll move forward. Uh, we did receive some emails, uh, about 10 of them. Okay. Sure. Uh, I wonder, the first one was, um, yeah, was um, from Mr. Renna, and we did reference his, uh, he wanted why the meetings were conflicted, so we did have that letter, and there was other stuff in it, but it did not pertain to him. Okay. okay. <clears throat> the first letter I received was from Al Zipperly of t 22946 Lone Oak Drive. He lives at 181 Cottage Road in Enfield. Um, he has concerns about the wetlands, where the water will go, where it currently goes, the bulk of it into Shaker Pines Lake. Um, he said, while the report seemed to show extensive steps in capturing, filtering, and routing that water, it still ends up in either Shaker Pines or Freshwater Creek. POA Northwest and POA West still go directly into Shaker Pines Lake, and I believe all of it ends up eventually in Freshwater Creek. He goes on to talk more about the proposal and stormwater concerns. Just state the name, address, and concerns. Mm -hmm. yep. yep, we all received these today. 
Um, I got a, we got another letter from Carrie Gayton of 48 Wheeler Drive. She has concerns about the stormwater study. Um, she's also concerned about the disappearing of these wetlands. Um, excuse me. Did the applicant receive a copy? So they could. Yes. Yes. We okay. Have good. Just so they could answer any yep. questions. <clears throat> um, the next letter we got was Edward and Pamela Schmaha of Five Bacon Road. Um, also worried about stormwater runoff, where that water is being diverted to into the brook on Bacon Road. She is concerned about flooding and the increase in water flow. Another letter we got was from Suzanne Parker, 144 Cottage Road. She has concern about wildlife impact and the wetland significance and what would happen if these wetlands are to be destroyed. She also has concerns about the stormwater management areas and flooding. Karen Wadsworth Mulready Harts of 147 Cottage Road. She also has concerns about wildlife species, particularly birds. And she has a special concern for the farmer's pond. And she would like the committee to conduct their own analysis. And that's pretty much it. James and Christine Silver, 8 West Shore Drive. They have concerns about the value and quality of life that the lake affords. They're also concerned about overall environmental and social impacts of the Wynn Stanley project. Lynn Sopolek, 45 Wheeler Drive. She said, these wetlands are vital to the health of our lakes, wildlife in our community. The building of a distribution center at this location would greatly disturb our ecosystem in this area. Leslie Cunningham, president of Shaker Pines Lake Association, 26 Wheeler Drive. Can you please read that in its fullness? Okay. So um, this email says, I am attaching a diagnostic evaluation and recommendations for management created by Bay State Environmental Consultants in 2006. We had this study completed to better understand our lake and how to properly maintain it. Page 28 and on addresses the watershed and its impact upon the lake. We have followed their recommendations at great expense to our community in an effort to preserve this asset. We are concerned much of our water volume comes from the surrounding watershed. That includes the area to be developed by Wynn Stanley. Currently, that watershed is already responsible for heavy nutrient loading of our lake due to the farming. Wynn Stanley has provided a storm management study showing a plan to mitigate, mitigate the runoff we know that Wynn Stanley wants to be a good neighbor, as do we. However, we have concerns that not enough study has gone into this plan. We have not seen an adequate study of potential pollutant sources, a site compliance evaluation, or a pollution prevention team, all recommended by DEEP. Additionally, if the runoff is going to be redirected, what will impact be on our lake water volume? If it causes less volume, our lake will suffer, as many areas are shallow and could dry up. If it increases the volume, the lake community will suffer flooding. Our current water volume with big storms is already overwhelming the spillway and inundating the commercial area of downtown with flooding and flooding basements on Cottage Road and Cozy Street. We are asking that the Inland Wetlands Board slow the process a bit and take the time to explore prudent and feasible alternatives to the interference with these wetlands and watersheds. Take the time to study the long-term impacts upon our lake that may be caused by new pollutants migrating <coughs> through and require proper protections. Study the impact of increase or decrease of the water volume in the lake and implement proper fixes. The town, Shaker Pines, Spruceland, and Crescent Lake all will feel the impacts of the development of such a big structure if this is not completed with an abundance of caution. We cannot turn back the clock once it is complete. So let's get these questions answered completely before moving forward. Thank you. Brenda Coleman, 24 Nancy Drive. She grew up on Crescent Lake, and she also enjoys the lake community. Uh, Wellens' concern she has is what will happen to the wildlife once this project moves forward. The Wellens project would disrupt the land, wildlife, and quiet living that residents have worked hard to maintain throughout the community. 
The land that will be destroyed will never be repaired and people's lives will never be the same. I've been a resident for 39 years and we need to maintain the best parts of town. Please take into consideration the lives the project will impact. <clears throat> this one is from Kathleen Hudson of 26 Wheeler <laughs> Drive. Um, she references the project in the first paragraph. She goes into the 1972 Weltons and Watercourse Act. She talks about the property owners and when they first purchased the property. The unique nature of this proposal calls for soil tests, best practice initiatives, engineering reports, and other relevant <coughs> parameters highlighted within an application process, including large industrial building projects. She's curious as if to any further questions or considerations have been done specific to wastewater disposal, rainwater runoff, and managed aquifers. Furthermore, has anyone required about hazard management, which would include the removal of a pond, construction of swales and retention ponds, couple of excavation that will undoubtedly cause additional vector-borne diseases. She also has concerns about fertilizers and snow and ice applications. And she references that the both lakes have worked diligently to improve water quality by educating residents, performing lake studies and lake treatments. And the larger issue of the fact is in 1972, the Inland Weltons called for a balancing proposed economic development and natural resources, an extremely delicate measure given the facts of this particular proposal. And that's all she references. Katie Regan of 50 Cottage Road uh, wrote to share her thoughts on the project. She's been a resident on Cottage Road um, for almost 10 years. <coughs> She talks about the tax abatement and then she goes into talking about um, trees and wildlife and how that this will now become warehousing, parking lot, outdoor lighting, and the sound of semi trucks beeping and rolling behind their yards. She has visual concerns like what impacts this will have on the quality of the lakes. More text. And then she has concerns about maintenance and treatments of the water. And that is all we have. Thank you. So next would be the applicants. Do you want to comment on sure. anything? Absolutely. Um, first, uh, I'd like to get into the record a uh, verification uh, regarding Mr. Zipperly's response mm -hmm. that I did not follow up. Um, apparently might be having software issues, but this is just a verification that I contacted him and I reached out to him, but there was no response. So what we'd like to do, if it uh, pleases the commission, we would like to keep this uh, really to the technical merits mm -hmm. under your jurisdiction. Yes, please. I understand the emotion and what people really mm -hmm. feel in their hearts, but that's not our charge. We have to address technical. Um, I think we will start with just reiterating the um, if I can find the right post development <coughs> watershed. Uh, let's do let's do this. And Jim, you uh, you chime in as well. So let's just start right back to where we were. Um, Kevin's requesting you speak a little louder. Louder! <laughs> That's better. Can you hear me, Kevin? Okay. Can you hear me, Kevin? <laughs> It'll help the audience as well. Yeah, so. sure. Okay, so we brought this watershed map up, and we need to make it quite clear what we're talking about. Uh, the neighbors have been talking, particularly in the Shaker Lake area, how this area will affect their lake when in fact this watershed is hundreds of acres it goes reaches up into massachusetts my client when stanley has absolutely no control over the contaminants that are being introduced in that watershed 
nor does he have control over any of the contaminants in this suburbanized watershed that's been allowed to be developed in the last 20 years. He also has no control over the bulkheading and the removal of uh, wetlands and other natural areas that had in the past filtered the pollutants from the pond, the lake. Okay? So what we're talking about here is a total wetland impact of 0 0.33. That isn't even numerically significant in the relationship of this entire watershed compared to the watersheds of these two water bodies. And I, 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 I mean no disrespect, but it's insignificant. In addition to that, the portion of the watershed in Shaker Pond catchment is here. That is it. And I think we've made it very clear what we're doing and how we're protecting these adjacent systems. We have studied the hydrology. We have a hydrological report. We know where the groundwater is. We understand that the pond, based on its dimensions, are roughly 200,000 gallons, correct? Okay. In the scheme of the groundwater flow in the entire aquifer, that was in those sandy deposits laid down by glacial till, it, it's not even, again, insignificant. Okay? So that's, that's that portion. We have, um, you know, we obviously want to be a good mate, a neighbor. We are trying to balance. Uh, we do have the absolutely legal right to propose what we're proposing. Regardless of what anyone thinks, that's what it is. That's the hard, that's the elephant in the room, really. Um, we've been very, very careful since uh, taking over the property. Uh, for instance, the farming that's been done, the contract that gets negotiated, um, we don't allow the use of pesticide applications. Every year they come through, they make the request to Rosa and uh, very careful about adding pesticides. We don't really know what Hallmark was doing before that, but we've, we've tried to control that. Okay. And moving forward, when we get the planning and zoning, they will hear that the Winstanleys have a policy of, we only use calcium chloride, we don't use sodium chloride. Um, we don't allow a lot of fertilization, we try to use organic fertilization. So I think soup to nuts, we are always trying to do what we can to minimize pollutants. Uh, what I'd like to do is have Jim talk a little bit more in detail about how these sediment basins work. Mm -hmm. I have to note that these meet fully the criteria of the state guidelines for stormwater basin design. They were designed in concert with the Connecticut DEP for the highest level of sedimentation and pollutant load removal. That's why Connecticut has those regs. You go to some other states, they don't have that. But they're specifically designed and they have to meet the criteria to allow them to capture the pollutants. Okay? Jim, do you want to talk a little bit about the volume of capture and address some of the concerns you heard? No. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. <laughs> um, yes, thank you for the record, Jim Petropoulos. I, I do appreciate the comments uh, from the abutters. Um, I, I apologize if I wasn't clear. Uh, Val did a nice job summarizing watersheds. There is no direct discharge of this property into Crescent Lake. Or Shaker. Or into Crescent Lake. Okay, there's no, this property does not drain into Crescent Lake. Now we told you in the pre-development condition, a, a 50 acre edge of our westerly property line goes to Shaker Lake and the abutters. In the north end, it's about a 250 foot area, and it's all woods, before development and after development. As we go along the common property line, there's an open field there. Uh, that field does drain uh, towards the property line. 
we're not increasing any discharge in that location. We're not increasing the watershed in that location. And as we further go to the south, the wooded areas as well. And I think I stated on record that in the pre-development condition is about 50 acres headed to the west. In the post-development condition, about 40 acres. There is no paved discharge from this project going to Shaker Lake. Okay, it's going into our proposed stormwater treatment uh, measures and then it works its way in the south east corner of the property to the existing discharge uh, which eventually flows south into Freshwater Brook. It, it does not cross the railroad tracks and get into Crescent Lake. So I wanted to be clear about that. Um, the, the, the basins themselves, as Val just said a minute ago, are designed in accordance with standards perfected by the, the state of Connecticut Department uh, Deep, um, in which they set forth to people like myself um, treatment measures to address stormwater in a qualitative sense off of these paved surfaces. And we've incorporated those measures um, into the design in four locations. Um, that stormwater report uh, will be reviewed by the town. It will be reviewed by a third party. It will be reviewed by Connecticut DEEP. And um, we believe it's a responsible design um, to, to, to treat surface water coming off this parking lot. And again, the, the, we are not draining to Shaker Lake, and we're not draining to Crescent Lake. Can I, uh, did you explain how you're going to maintain them? I know sure. that was you concern know, the, of people the, about it. Do you want me to? I mean, well, I think what happens is that these sedimentation basins, there's, per, there's certain provisions mm -hmm. for them to, to work. And as part of maintenance, what Adams Property Managers do now is they monitor mm -hmm. um, the depth, the sediment. Um, we have been involved in two or three other properties elsewhere in Connecticut. As soon as we took them over, we were like, oh my goodness, they hadn't been cleaned out. Uh, there hadn't been any kind of maintenance to these mm -hmm. basins, even some of the catch basins. So Adams Property Managers, um, they have a system and they maintain the basins if they need them. Um, I think the four bay and there's certain areas where, as you can imagine, as water enters the stormwater basin, it slows down. That's how it's designed. It not it not only just slows down to uh, remove flooding and gouging, that reduced velocity allows sediment yeah. to right. hit the bottom. It's all about providing residents in these basins exactly. to let the suspended solids yep. slip out. Yep. That, that's a, mm -hmm. a large part of it. And then you clean it out every so often. And, and yeah. Sure, there's there's maintenance, there's record keeping. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, the four bays, uh, you can get down. It, it's difficult to get a small bobcat into these mm -hmm. things. It's generally handwork to be done, to, to be honest mm -hmm. with you, that removes accumulated sediment. Mm -hmm. And then it's just it's just common sense on the inspections around the basin. If some of the side slopes have eroded, they need to be repaired and mm -hmm. fixed. Um, and it's, you know, photo documentary uh, of, you know, um, on you know, usually a quarterly basis on, on the condition of the, the stormwater wetland that we're creating, the picture that we, we, mm -hmm. we brought up before. So, um, you know, I think the stormwater industry in the last hundred years has been <laughs> tremendously <laughs> neglected. <laughs> and, and now it is being, uh, and deservedly so, um, paid attention to in greater detail. So property owners such as this and a large property such as this will need ongoing maintenance of stormwater, mm -hmm. just like some of the other systems in the building. Right. One other right. important thing about the, those sediment four bays in those systems is that a lot of the contaminants that you're concerned about that would be associated with road runoff and vehicles and things like that are attached to the sediment right. material. So when it drops into these four bays, the velocities slow down, the sediment drops out, and all the contaminants that you would find are attached to those soil particles, and they settle out in the bay, in the four basin. Then the cleaner water can go out and over the spillway into the wetland restoration, the wetland portion of it, and the plants and everything there can uptake anything that's left over. And that way, it, you know, by the time the water is coming out the other end or infiltrating into the groundwater system beneath it, it's it's pretty well clean and um, 
so and then you know then as long as you maintain those four base of systems that's how you remove that um, that's how you keep those systems functioning appropriately so they do have to be maintained mm -hmm. the other thing is when we do clean out these basins um, the the sediment before it's taken off site is tested that's one of the requirements so we understand what it is if there's contaminants in it uh, there are certain areas that require, you know, testing and um, um, mixing and things of that sort. But, you know, we just don't do this on our own. In fact, sometimes if the maintenance is to a certain level, we would be back to this commission and asking approval yeah. because we think it might be a disturbance. Mm -hmm. So I think we've covered those. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to talk a little bit about, um, there was a mention of how long it took us to do the alternatives. Um, and you know it was so difficult yes it was difficult but the time it took was really our back and forth to make sure adam had a viable project mm -hmm. he had to run construction numbers he had to check with marketing people to see if it was viable so that doesn't happen uh, i mean maybe our work could have been done in a few months mm -hmm. but adam really needed to test this and make sure he could construct it and that there was marketability for it so that entire process was interdisciplinary, and it took, you know, just about a year, just to be clear. Um, I've made no, I'm, I'm trying to hit all the, all the points. We've made specific points of questions. Um, we did, as part of the, um, the high bay and the low bay work, both required Connecticut DEP stormwater permits. And as you know, in order to uh, procure those permits, you have to check with the Natural Diversity Database. Mm -hmm. So we have been up front and close with Natural Diversity Database since 2016. We continue to monitor species. Mm -hmm. um, here is the map, as you will see, and I will just show you over up here, the Natural Diversity Database um, uh, area is really confined to the Shaker <coughs> lake watershed and it bleeds over slightly through here mm -hmm. so there's just minimal uh, involvement and even though there is minimal involvement you know there is a process you can go to DEP and say look at no harm no foul we did not pursue that we just went right to NDDB Scott and his team worked with NDDB on 25 bacon we had no issues we had no species I mean, you know you get the list, but we discounted those. And same thing this time. Mm -hmm. We've been in at least once. Mm -hmm. We've submitted a second time just to give them the studies that Scott has been doing. Mm -hmm. And we don't believe there's any impacts. Um, and he's provided the, the, the habitat evaluations for that. So for the record, this is what the map looks like. <coughs> Thank you. Sorry. That's all right. And Kevin can't see it, but here it is. <laughs> Did, everybody, Did you get the right copies? Do you need one more? I think I should. Yeah, I think. No, we got enough. One page. We're fine. Yeah, okay. Um, anything more to say about diversity? National diversity database. Um, well, the, you mentioned that there, there was a number of species that were that they came back with mm -hmm. as potentially occurring on or near the site. And so we conducted surveys. Uh, one of the reasons why we mapped out all the natural communities on the site is because a lot of these species are associated with particular types of natural plant communities. So mm -hmm. like pitch pine scrub oak habitats is, is one example. Um, so we carefully walked the entire site and m mapped all of the different plants, you know, did um, plots and um, measured the vegetation you know, estimated percent cover of the different species of trees and shrubs and herbaceous plants that were there and came back and identified what natural community they were and whether or not those were associated with the species of interest or not. Um, so we, we did that for a lot of the species were associated with the, the pitch pine barrens type habitats, which we did not find on site. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then there was one plant that was associated with um, wetlands, uh, the dwarf bulrush, and um, I had one of my co-workers, a botanist, came out and we went out to a couple of the wetlands on two different occasions and surveyed for the plan. We weren't able to find it. So. 
so we continue to work with DP and uh, we're no strangers to that process and certainly understand again the interest in wildlife and species but I think we've um, we've certainly covered our bases when it comes to that particular thing um, with regard I think the last comment before I turn it over to attorney Cody um, environmental studies I mean as part of this we have done stormwater studies we've done hydro hydrogeologic um, we have covered the site with borings uh, we have borings reports I mean we, we have done everything I think that if we had for instance hit high groundwater um, or looked at you know some other kind of conditions this proposal would look different mm -hmm. um, but I think we have evaluated the impact of this building I think we've evaluated the impact to the wetlands and um, before you is I think really the best compromising balance. Mm -hmm. Attorney Cody. Thanks. Uh, I'm Tom Cody. I'm an attorney with the firm of Robinson and Cole in Hartford. And um, as Val said, I've, I've been working with this team on behalf of Lynn Stanley. I had just a couple of thoughts, a couple of comments on some process questions that were asked, mm -hmm. uh, some regulatory questions that were asked by members of the public. Um, as Val just said, we, starting with the application itself, your regulations have a pretty specific list of the materials that are required and the information that, re that is required. We checked all of those mm -hmm. boxes and then yeah. some. And we did optional studies that are referenced in the regulations. We've provided all that. So when the question is asked, have you studied the environmental impact of this? answer is resoundingly yes we have very thoroughly done that and it is all before you and it's been presented to you both in the written materials that have been on file mm -hmm. in town hall for quite some time now as well as our presentation this evening um, there were a number of questions tonight and many many comments about wildlife mm -hmm. deer turkeys bald eagles um, Respectfully, none of that is relevant to this commission's decision making on this permit application. And the reason for that is that it's specifically in your regulations. Section 10.6 says that a wetland agency shall not deny or condition an application for a regulated activity in an area outside wetlands or watercourses on the basis of an impact or effect on aquatic plant or animal life unless that activity impacts the physical characteristics of the wetlands themselves. So that provision follows several important cases that went to our Connecticut Supreme Court that, that, mm -hmm. that clarified that, and that issue was litigated and clarified, and your regulations now incorporate mm -hmm. the proper standard. So none of the, none of the research and investigation that we have done indicates that there are any wildlife species that would directly impact the physical characteristics of the wetlands themselves. And so we would submit that the comments about wildlife tonight really are not relevant to your decision making on the application. You also have very specific decisional criteria mm -hmm. Val went through that in our presentation. She took great care to explain how we believe the application satisfies each of those criteria. A question was asked, several folks asked questions about insurance. Is there a mechanism to provide an insurance policy? And, I'm, and, and I have to say there is not. There is not a mechanism for a wetland commission to condition an application based upon providing an insurance policy for some future impact. And, and one of the reasons for that is, is what Val mentioned a short while ago, which is that there are all, already impacts in the environment today to the water bodies in this area. And, and trying to measure a future impact is impossible. And so it would simply not be fair or legal to require an insurance policy at some point. I've had this question asked of me 
by other uh, commissions in other towns, and, and the answer has been consistently the same. Um, finally, I would just note that the wetland statute, which is what your regulations are based upon and authorized by, contemplate development. In fact, that's why we have a whole permit process in the first place. And it is, as has been said tonight, a question of looking at the criteria and deciding when you have a permit before you, does it meet these criteria? And the feasible and prudent alternative standard, I think, is, is really the most important of those criteria. Um, and we have demonstrated that there are no feasible and prudent alternatives. It takes into account the environmental investigations we were obligated to do and did. And it also takes into account the balancing of economic and environmental factors. And that's exactly what the statute was written to, to sort of capture, and your regulations uh, capture that as well. So um, we thank you very much for your time and diligence on this. And uh, if you have any further questions for us, we're happy to answer them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kevin, do you have anything? Can you hear? Kevin, do you have any questions? Kevin, you're muted. Can you go, do you have any questions? Take that or do you want to take <laughs> <laughs> well, some of it's quantitative, some of it's qualitative, but um, uh, I mean, the, let's, let's the, start with the pond itself. Yeah, the, the functions of the pond and values of it being a wetland and a wetland system could, uh, you know, you've got wetland vegetation, you've got open water area, so the stormwater basins would be built similarly. So you would have the same types of habitat cover types, the same type of open water area, and presumably that would provide the same functionality that the pond provides. Um, I'd say maybe one difference is that the, the pond itself is probably, because it was excavated so deeply, it may intersect the groundwater table, whereas the pond um, is, I mean, the stormwater basin is going to be actually cleaning the water before it drops it into the into the groundwater table rather than surface runoff from the farm field coming in directly into that pond and into the water table that's beneath it. Right. The other thing is just observations of having been out there so many times that the, yes the depth of the pond is one thing um, you know because of its confined nature and its steepness it's a, the pond is the wetlands it's the water course. Whereas the stormwater uh, wetlands that we're creating have more opportunity for biodiversity because there was going to be marsh systems associated uh, lower grasses, things of that sort. So over time, as those establish, of course, you could imagine, I think the diversity of the stormwater created uh, wetlands will be higher than, than the pond. Yeah, the pond is, is pretty, mo mostly just the pond itself, the yeah. open water. The pond area. is the pond, and it will always be just the pond. The stormwater basins will evolve. Um, we're, we're using a various seed mixes. We're using pollinator mixes. Um, we're doing everything we can to, so not just uh, increase, as we said, 10 to 1, the amount of wetland, it's also the higher value. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Sure. Yeah, um, another question, is there, is there any provision for uh, a truck washing station or anything? 
they going to wash trucks on the property? We do not have really any not. truck washing on the facility. Nor, nor is there any on 25 bacon. Right. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. And I did see they have the snow files documented. <laughs> we always ask for that. Yeah. <laughs> I was happy to see that. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any questions? I do not. Jenny? I have one question, just as an observation. What is bulkheading? When I was looking at the watershed of the um, of Shaker Lake, mm -hmm. I haven't gone right to the edge, but it looked like that the edge of the pond has been um, angleized and, and it's actually moved in. So I guess people keep moving their front yards or backyards into the pond, which of course reduces your ability to attenuate flooding. But it also knows like it seems like they have, um, that they have possibly lined it with something or it just looks more angular than the way it looked. Maybe they just sculpted it out so it's straight, but it looked like it was almost in some areas, maybe bulkheaded or maybe they put a little bit of stone wall or something. Oh, okay. So the bulkheading per se is just a, a loose term for trying to reinforce the edge of your property mm -hmm. yep. so you don't lose any more. I mean, remember a, a watershed, you, you're supposed to lose. The soil yeah. to comes in and it yeah. fills in and succession takes over. Um, and so, you know, when you live on a lake, you're fighting mother nature. Very much like a beach. Yeah. So, um, you know, trying to maintain that edge so you have your, your yard. That was just an observation. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. okay. um, is there anybody else in the public that would like to speak again? Yeah. Uh, gentlemen, okay. yeah, just pull that last Okay. I didn't see you raise your hand. Randy Dagle, 55 Cottage Road, Connecticut. A couple of things I snow storage. When when during the winter, where's all the snow being stored? Um, is it being stored in the detention area or is it being stored on the lawn? All the contaminations that are being picked up by the snow, where's all that going? Okay. We'll answer that after. Okay. Um, just for the record, anything that's submitted to the council must be read in full. It can't be summarized. Yeah, we're not the council. Yeah. Yeah. Pardon me? It's we're not, not the, the council. council. Our regulations say we can just say yeah. the, uh, what it's about. Yeah. Give an overview. Um, it, I, I, excuse me. I just want you to know that it will be part entirely part of the record. Yes. Yeah. They also all received copies. Um, yeah. One thing. Um, your, your designated detention area, I know for a fact, and we've moved them many times, we would not, the state of Connecticut, if you submitted that drawn site plan to the state, we would not allow that detention area to be above that, that waterway, the, the water, the, that line that you mentioned over there. Um, it, you've got to be several, several hundred feet away from the water source. Um, and, and, and to correct you um, regarding the water that comes from up above that feeds the lake, we have to lower our lake several times a year to allow the docks to come in. Sometimes the vegetation is extreme. We lower it to treat it. When we lower our lake, that pond in the farmers gets lowered also. So it's directly re related. There, you know, you, as much as you want to show pretty pictures of a line coming from 25 miles away, it's that is. That active field is 100% feeding, feeding in our area. Sure, we're getting some water from up upstream from other areas, but when we lower our lake, that pond gets lowered. And gentleman from AE Cotton verified it. He said he was out there, like five feet lower. It doesn't just evaporate five feet. It go, we lower our lake five feet so we can put docks in. So when you saw five feet of that pond shallow in, that's because we lowered our lake. We raise our lake in, that pond goes back up. We, you guys really need to look into how this is going to affect the, the, the aquifer regarding the, the, the two lakes, you know, I, I just don't, so the, the store, snow storage is a big, big concern. I know it is at the state level when we do all our universities, all our campuses, everything, you're picking up all this sludge from these 
168 tractor trailers are estimated. Mm -hmm. They're sitting there idling. When you pick up the snow, where's it being dumped? On mm -hmm. the side of the grass. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not being retained or detained or picked up. That's just going in the regular grass, and that's going into the next abutters, which is 25 feet away, well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just hope the town of Menfield does their due diligence, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you will, but I just really wanted to make sure. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is nothing we can redo. You got one shot at this. If we either do it right, and you know what, like I said, they're a good company. If they wait another six to eight months until we get all the answers, maybe that's what it takes. But if, you know, I understand you guys are meeting your regulations, you're meeting the minimum regulations, and yes, the town does have the authority to supersede what the minimum requirements are. So if the town requires an insurance policy, the town can require an insurance policy. No. No. <laughs> somebody else in the audience? Between the street? Gentleman in the back. See my name again? Or? Yes, yeah. please. Sure. Uh, Chris Reno, 2 Jewel Street. Um, and so just strictly wetlands because that's, that's mm -hmm. all we're talking. That's all we're talking. <laughs> right. So those wetlands have been here longer than anyone in this room. Um, so to say we can only concentrate on the wetlands and the, what, what's going to happen. So if we build right over those active wetlands, and, and you're going to destroy what's there. And then, and then create newer, better wetlands. Why are we destroying the ones that are there in the first place? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we should be preserving the ones that are there. And I know that you're being told that you have this limited jurisdiction, but I would encourage you, and I know from personal experience, sometimes when we have decisions to make, we, and we do this all the time, we don't actually go back to the statutes, the codes, the regulations, um, that we are governed by. And so just take a look at section 22A-36. You have the ability um, to deny this application and or to postpone it, to come up with a better plan that doesn't affect the wetlands um, in this manner. Uh, it's a pretty drastic decision. And so I just urge you to take some time to review that um, and use your authority wisely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there else? Samantha Weber, 20 Cranberry Hollow. Um, I know at this point we've heard a great deal about studies that Wynn's family has paid for. <coughs> I think as taxpayers in this town, we need to see you, the town, do their own research. Their, you know, for, for lack of a better word, you know, a second opinion. Are there any case studies out there that show the impact of you know, similar buildings, similar properties, built in similar areas, shoehorned between two bodies of water? Um, you know, I. They spoke about the stormwater basins you know, properties that they've acquired where they've found that these, you know, basins had not been properly maintained or cared for. What, what's to say that when Stanley isn't at some point going to, you know, they miss an uh, inspection one quarter or some, something happens that they don't get the attention, you know, that they need. Um, they talk about the... <coughs> You know, the fact that you know, these new man-made ponds, these man-made wetlands are, have the potential to be more diverse than the pond that was in the farmer's field previously. How long is it going to take to rebuild that ecosystem, to rebuild that diversity and get all those animals to come back after you forced them out or killed them. You know, and I know it was mentioned that you know, the additional watershed is only a 0 0.33 impact and that's irrelevant. That that's insignificant. You can sit here and roll your eyes while we speak. 
and look at your cell phone while we speak, I don't think that's insignificant to any room. And to say that there's no legal way to hold Wynn Stanley responsible for any additional impact, obviously there's a baseline now. If there's testing going on now, there's a baseline to see if there was an impact after this building is built, God forbid, or compared to what it you know what it is now. I don't I don't think that it you can call it insignificant, but I hardly think it that is at all. And I think it's disrespectful that you know, we have well he's probably got he's probably got the bed now, but you, know, you, know, you have young Chase and you know River are coming up here, you know, these women that have lived on this these lakes for sixty plus years. It's disrespectful to tell them that anything is irrelevant or insignificant. Thank you. Thank you. Sherry Jackson, 119 Cottage Road. Um, I don't feel like we got answers to all of our questions. I know you guys are writing them down. Were you checking them off as they were answered? Because I, I heard four different people say that they're wondering if the environmental impact statement was done for this project, and that question did not get answered. I heard four people asking it. Mm -hmm. So if you, I don't know what, I don't know how this works really. I'm an elementary school teacher, I know about that, but I don't know how you, you guys have to force, have to oversee that our questions were actually answered. And if they weren't, is there another time that they can be answered? Um, the other thing I want to talk about is endangered species. And I, I heard that there was not much of a concern here about um, wild animals from, from this group here. But endangered species are over, overseen by other governmental agencies. And we will make sure that they get contacted here today. So thank you. Your name, you guys, do your name and address. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Hanley Kenneth, 72 Spruce Lane Road, Enfield, Connecticut. Uh, my question is, you guys, God forbid, say yes. Next step, these guys build. What's the next step? Yeah. They can't answer that. We'll answer it after. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Was there? Can we? Yeah, I know. Is there anybody else? Yes. No. Question. Sure. Um, again. Quick thing. Um. Your name? Stacy Daigle, 55 Cottage. Um. For him to say that. The wetlands aren't impacted, or the animals aren't impacted by the wetlands, and it has nothing to do with it. It seems rather silly to me, because animals thrive on wetlands, and that's where they drink, and that's mm -hmm. where they get their vegetation thrive. So I, I'm not sure why you said that. But um, also, another point somebody has raised is when Stanley has done their due diligence in making all these studies, but. Do we have a responsibility to our town to do our own studies and compare them and to see what we see in our company that we hire on what they come up with and not just what Wynn Stanley has come up with? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. So was there anybody else for the third time? No. Okay, moving moving forward. Um, Georgie, you want to? Um, I just wanted to address something that I heard earlier. Um, there were concerns about an aquifer layer being um, brought up. Um, I'm also the aquifer agent for the town of Enfield. I'm the staff liaison for the aquifer protection agency. Enfield has six level A mapped aquifers. All have been finalized and mapped back in the early 2000s. This project is not within the aquifer layer. Just want to make that clear. Um, thank you. Would you like us to 
address? Yes, you okay. can. Okay. Um, snow storage areas, uh, I, I believe our plans do, do they show do, they're on the site. Yes, yes, they're on the site plan. Um, I, I'm not quite sure of the question about the state of Connecticut's allowance on water sources. Um, um, so I, I'm not sure how I can ad address that. Um, the pond and the discussion and connection with groundwater, the point again is that it's a uh, confined pond. There's groundwater there, but again, we mentioned the dimensions and the hydrologic connection um, w will not result in any kind of significant um, um, or measurable uh, change. It's literally 200,000 gallons. Um, we are not diverting water. Um, we're, we're not doing anything that would punch the groundwater or, or drain the ponds in either direction or lakes. It's just, you know, that's the, that, that's the analyses that we did as part of our, our uh, geotech borings. Again, if the groundwater was two feet underneath ground surface, we might be having a different discussion. Okay? Um, in terms of, um, oh yes, I was checking, um, I apologize for your last name, Chris. I was still trying to figure out where Two Jewel was, and I couldn't find it. I looked on my phone, and I still haven't been able to find it on my phone, so that's why I was looking. I was just interested because I thought I used to know someone that lives on Jewel Street. So, full disclosure. I was like, I think I know where that is. Um, uh, I think we talked about diversity, the natural diversity database. Um, I think maybe the person that had the comment missed what we were saying. We're actually involved with the Connecticut DEP and we're working with the DEP. We're not working with you folks on the Natural Diversity Database. That, that's a DEP thing. And um, as I said, we had no problems at 25 Bacon. Uh, the line is still the same, it just juts over ours. And you heard Scott talking about what we've done to confirm that we are not finding any species of concern. Um, environmental impact. There's no provision in your wetland regulations for um, a environmental impact statement. Mm -hmm. That doesn't preclude us from not doing the work, as Attorney Cody had pointed out, that all the provisions have evaluated what the actions are um, and how they affect the environment, and our application included that. Okay. Um, I think um, I think I touched on everything. Next step. So I think we've I think we've addressed all of the comments. Mm -hmm. uh, we would ask for the oh next step question. The next step would be planning and zoning commission. Mm -hmm. So you go through wetlands. You can go through wetlands and planning and zoning at the same time, and that's what that's the next step. Whoever I forgot who asked that question. Okay, there you go. Uh, any other questions? Um, I just wanted to comment is, I know a few people, people asked about maintaining those storm management systems and that. Um, usually in the past when we approve applications, we put it into the, into the decision that those have to be maintained, they have to give reports into the town hall, uh, to Georgie every so often, mm -hmm. forever. Uh -huh. So we do make sure that the people, if we approve applications with those kind of systems, yeah. that they are maintained and they do what they're supposed to do. Yep. follow up and the town follows up to make sure those happen. Mm -hmm. So that was just comment on that. <laughs> yeah. So I think that concludes our response. Sorry. <laughs> Madam Chair. Lori. Yes. So Lori Whitten, Director of Development Services. Um, I, I did notice there was a lot of concern about the contaminants. So right now it's a farm field and there was, I, I'm assuming, and I don't know this for a fact, that it used to be a tobacco field. So there's chlordane and deodorant on the property. Is that? You know that for sure? I, I, I don't know that. That's, that's my question. So, we, so there's, no, there's never been any evidence that we have, you know of. We have done uh, phase two. We have, we have okay, done, done phase, phase one two. and phase two, as our application has asked. Um, we did find certain traces of it. 
We consulted and continue to consult with DEP. In fact, Adam and Stanley has been working very closely with them. Uh -huh. um, we do have a soil management plan that we would yep. put in place. Um, we do think that, you know, obviously that um, those types of things that are being picked up on our property seem to be, uh, co you know, occurring in, in other areas and adjacent areas. Uh -huh. um, and I think we're dealing with it uh, the way we should be dealing with it. Um, right. And we have full DEP cooperation. Adam? Yeah, I can. I, I know I haven't said a lot tonight. So I, have, I have a lot of different uh, different things I could talk about. But one thing I will say is people have to understand that every piece of property in Connecticut has some amount of pesticides that are, that have been applied legally over the years. That's um, right. I I am the owner of this property, and and I have continued to do farming leases in the back. But myself and my property manager have stopped the use of pesticides on the property. So they have no longer been applied for the last five years or so. And so that's that's more like a personal belief. Um, you know, I try and look at all of my properties and we try and contribute in a lot of different ways. But one thing that I just like kind of in conclusion to, to say here is that you know, in the world of development today, there's there's a lot of different types of owners and operators. The, the, the business today has become very commoditized. There's a lot of publicly traded companies that own properties that have headquarters in California, and they don't, they don't care about development. They don't care about the communities that they work in. Like, my properties in this town, um, you know, I've continued to buy properties, and, you know, we own and operate our properties. We care about how our properties look. We maintain our detention basins. I mean, if I see like one pothole in any of my properties, you know, we are, I'm on the phone to my property managers. We're fixing things. We're making sure our properties look good because I care. And, and the reality is I, I've been in the real estate business for 32 years. Um, I, I'll be the first to admit I've never been in, I've never done any project where there's not some amount of opposition. You can never really make everybody happy. But my job is that I'm trying to do the best project that I can here. And I know that that's not what people want to hear about. And I do, I will say that I have studied this property incessantly for five years. And I have turned down large deals with Fortune 500 companies that wanted me to commit to build 1.2 or larger deals here. But ultimately, when we get to the next step, there is more to this process, and this process is putting a lot of our outboard parcels into conservation so that they can't be developed. Mm -hmm. And there's other components of our project that will come out later. And this is a much smaller building, and it has a lot less impact and the most important thing that I care about on this particular site is our project has a very thick tree line all the way around it. And all the other projects I looked at caused us to take down that tree line. And I am not gonna do that with this project. So I'm trying to look at every possible angle and I realize, again, we're not gonna make everybody happy, but we're trying to do the best job we can. And I will tell you that everybody on my development team I seek out the very best people that I can find in the industry. I have spared no expense on every single report and everything that I've studied over the last five years. I, I don't do any shoddy work and we don't cut corners on my projects. And that's all I have to say. So. <laughs> Thank you. I, I just wanted to clarify, the reason I brought that up is that there will be no more deposition of these pesticides and actually covering it up actually helps it from Right, right. We, we, well, we'll be, right. More, uh, yeah, we'll be employing intense. DEP protocol. They've given us guidance right. on how to do to the soil, and, and that's what we're going to do. And you've also taken care of trying to maintain a good maintenance system, detention yeah. system that's going to cleanse any other waters. Absolutely. So in, in, in theory, you could have less discharge and cleaner waters than current. And that was the case uh, with 25 bacon also. Yeah. And just, I was just curious, you said 200,000 
um, gallons. Uh -huh. I was, I, that's what I looked up on my phone. I was like, so what's the size? What, how many gallons are in an Olympic right. sized pool? Right. And that's 660,000 gallons. Correct. Mm -hmm. So it's about a third of an Olympic sized pool. Correct. As far as water quantity. Water quantity. Yes, yes. Hmm. Yes. yes. So, um, thank you. George, you had something? Um, yeah, I just wanted to clarify. Um, a gentleman asked earlier about whether or not the facility will be built on stilts. Um, that is a requirement mostly for new construction for projects within the 100 year flood zone. This project is not within any of the flood zones. I just wanted to clarify that. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the. Um, Snow piles, as Bob just mentioned, they are on the site plans. If somebody wants, yeah. yeah. Somebody can see them. Somebody can see them. Do we have the site plan on here? Yeah. Uh, could, I could do not know if the, the rendering at that level. If let's go to the gym. Um, okay, site plan. Yeah. yeah, we have the site plans. Sal, I think they're on there for you. Do you. Oh, this is. Me. Yeah, this is fine. I think we should use what's been submitted. Yep. So we've identified throughout the site plan, you know, uh, <coughs> I'm going to guess somewhere in the range of maybe six to eight areas of the site, you mm -hmm. know, where snow will be uh, stockpiled. I think what's important, and I think what the gentleman was trying to ask is, are these in areas that will ultimately drain into these stormwater practices and not be pushed into any neighboring properties or not be stockpiled and then hauled and then hauled away. And, and that is the case. They're all within they're all within areas where they will drain, they will drain into our proposed practices mm -hmm. and not off the property or not heading towards somebody else's mm -hmm. property or not heading towards Shaker Lake. Mm -hmm. Can you point out where they are? Where the stockpile areas are, sir? If you'd like me to, sure. Madam Chair, is that okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, Thank sir, there, there, there's throughout the site. Just don't, excuse me, just don't touch the screen. That won't really be messed up. So we budgeted areas on the outside, okay? We budget areas on the outside of these longer runs for trailers in which they will plow in those directions. And so they're located here. They're located along this windrow here for the roads, here, here, here and here. So they're all located within areas that will drain into the stormwater practices. So you're, you're yeah. Madam Chair, this isn't a call of queen. Thank you. Um, in addition to that, he's answering our question, though. Yeah. Yeah. In, in addition Thank to you. those areas, if we have a significant storm, mm -hmm. um, Adam Check does have way. provisions in his property management that that they will remove the snow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's not going to be dumped into the lakes. It's not going to be dumped. I mean, we, yeah. we have to accommodate it. Um, and he's got professionals yeah. that handle that. Yeah. And um, yeah, know, we just like to keep it away from the wetlands, you know. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And it showed that it was not. Yes. A lot of it. Um, we are past that, so. Yeah. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes. Somebody wants to ask another question? No? Maureen Butler, 69 West Shore Drive. It's just a little bit of a follow-up. The comment was made that the town follows through, that, that the uh, things are maintained, that um, are presented. Mm -hmm. I'd like to mention that I don't know how many years ago the town put through sewer pipes uh, in front of a beach lot property on West Shore Drive and put a retaining wall around those pipes and have right away access to the pumping station okay. and shake the Okay, this is not part of this application, so if you could take that up with the Georgie later on yeah. during the week, okay. she, yeah, but she could address that. Okay, to me an example of the uh -huh. follow-up the town okay. does well, you or doesn't do yeah. makes yeah. us skeptical. That's okay, all. thank you. You could follow up with Georgie during the week on that. Thank you. So we need a motion to continue or close the public hearing. Are you there, Kevin? He's on mute again.
Yeah. Okay, I was just saying it's, uh, uh, we're on the point of either continuing or closing the public hearing. How do you feel about continuing or closing the public hearing, Kevin? Kevin, do you want to close or continue the public hearing? Yes. Kevin, <laughs> do you want to close or continue the public hearing? Question mark. Uh, town, town council closed at 8.30ish, 8.15ish. Oh, okay. That's, that's, that's even better. So, uh, I, I feel like we need to close the public hearing. Yeah. Yeah, close it. So. Okay. I, I move that we close the public hearing. Um, IW641. I second. Any more discussion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Dana Corbin Savinsky. Yes. Virginia Higley. Yes. Robert Hendrickson. Yes. Kevin Zorda. <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> yes or Motion no? To close. <laughs> Motion to close. Motion to close. Yes or no? He said yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. Four in favor, motion passes. Um, so the public hearing is now closed, and we will follow yep. up in two weeks yep. uh, for a decision and yep. uh, type of thing. So you're going to table the decision? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Now, we have a lot of material here and, you know, listening to yeah. people. No, I just, I just want to make that clear. Yeah, yes. yeah. Now, I wouldn't want to make a decision today. I'd like to look everything over. and uh, It would be our next meeting, which is February 1st. February 1st. Yeah. I just put the mouse. Yeah, I got you. Can I see the mouse? Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you all for coming. And we're, we do apologize for the room, but this is what we get stuck with a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, we can continue to continue the meeting. <coughs> Everybody here? Yep. Kevin, we're starting again. Oh, everyone left. Okay. Okay, good. Um, let me see. Old business. Old business, Old business is IW 636 uh, 59 Cottage Road is continued to February 1st. Next is our POCD information. Um, we have a motion to table that. Uh, I vote. Oh. No, go ahead. I vote that we table POCD until the February 1st meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, Kevin? Kevin? Kevin, you're on mute. Just unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah, but I can't hear anything anybody's saying. Um, so they made a motion to table, table the POCD. POCD. All in favor? <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Number 12 is new business, seeing none. Enforcement report is none. Report of planning staff, application update. Do you have any? Um, yes, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, there, there was a typo that staff did not catch that was on our previous application that also got carried over to the new application. And I just want to address this small error. On the public hearing part, which is the last page of our application, it says notice to immediate butters by certified mail, not 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 less that 21 days prior to start the public hearing. Oh, this number that. is incorrect. It should state between 10 to 15 days prior. And then the other thing is, is um, the next thing says a copy of the abutters letter and proof of mail notification is to be provided to the printing office. I wanted to cross off the part that says a copy of the abutters letter. Um, because usually 
procedural wise, yeah. when we send them the legal ad, yeah. the legal ad is what they send to the neighbors. So, mm -hmm. um, and that was the only thing that we had to fix. Is it going to say between 15 and 10, or is it? Yes, it would say between 15 and 10 because that's what's stated in our bylaw. Yeah, and it actually, is there's more words in the bylaw. Shouldn't like 15 for something and 10 for something. Yeah, that's for the legal advertisements for public hearing. Mm -hmm. um, so there's between 10 and 15 and no less than is it three days, two days? Three. Two and ten and ten and fifteen and no two. Yeah, and that's not for. Yeah, because this is fifteen to ten, so it's kind of like so backwards. So for example, ten to fifteen. For example, when Stanley had ten between the fifteenth and the tenth day before the public hearing to mail out their butters, they chose to mail it out on the thirteenth day. So it's a range. Um, okay. It's what's set. In All the right. Statute. Okay. Because I kept reading it saying, that it doesn't make sense more to me. More than 15 <laughs> or less, less than, than 10. 10. That's what the phone yeah. says. Yeah, so that's all yeah. between 15 and 10 is just a more simpler way for if, people to understand. Okay. If, if we're redoing it, shouldn't it say not less than? Yes, but yeah. instead, that's just going to be crossed out. So it will say. No, the highlighted portion. Yes. That's going to be crossed that's out. Oh, that's crossed, crossed out? out? Yeah. Good. Okay. So it's going to say, it. notice to immediate butters by certified mail between 15 okay. to 10 days. Sorry about prior. that. Thank okay. you. No and I will provide you with a new, new copy. Oh. Of our new copy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just approve that mistake and we're good to go. Okay. Uh, okay. Motion? Yeah. I mean, motion to approve that. Uh, oh. Bob. Yeah. Motion, motion to approve the application update. I motion to approve the application <laughs> update. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Kevin, Kevin says aye. Kevin. Okay. Okay. All in favor, motion passes. Thank you. Um, next is the new Inland Wetlands Water Course training. So um, finally, happy to announce Deep's Municipal Inland Wetlands Agency Comprehensive Training yeah. Program has Woo. been reactivated. Yay. I've given you all the email and the link. It is free training. I'm going through it right now, and it's, it's so detailed and it's so descriptive, and I really, really recommend it. Speaking of that training, that is where I got this pamphlet from. Um, I thought it was a great idea that maybe we could use from our POCD goals to, mm -hmm. to, to meet the goal of an educational pamphlet. Yes. Um, I have had a couple residents call require, require inquiring about educational pamphlets for Inland Wetlands, and I thought this would be a great start to mimic, maybe mimic something. Yep. Um, I also thought this was great because it particularly talked about agriculture. Mm -hmm. And I know we have some agriculture applications coming up. And the whole part of having agriculture of wetlands can be very, very, very confusing mm -hmm. as to what's exempt and what's yep. not exempt. Mm -hmm. So I thought this would be a little light reading for you guys. Thank you. To give you homework. But homework. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know I like the homework. Yeah, and uh, I definitely recommend you guys revamp on the training. It's a great program, and they've even added like little games and stuff. So I really, really, really recommend it. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. New applications to be received, DPN 2022-0104A, IW 642-147 Abbey Road, determination of per permit need for the removal of soils to allow trenching for the installation of irrigation pipelines within the regulated areas. Jarmic Real Estate LLC owner, Owen Jarmic applicant, map 85, lot 16, R44. <coughs> so we're just receiving these today. Yeah, so they're all the same legal description if you just want to read the file numbers into the record. Yeah, um, DPN 2022-0104B, IW643, 24 Charnley, Charnley Road, Charnley. Still Lane. Um, DPN 2022-01-04C, IW644-128 Moody Road. Uh, DPN 2022-01-04D, IW645-46 Grant Road. DPN 2022-01-04E, IW646-131 Town Farm Road. That's it. Oh, and, one more. and then uh, another application to be received is IW 647, the 1700 King Street Hi. wetland application to correct a violation within the escarpment area. Ignacio Carballo, owner, applicant, map 14, lot 27, R33. So those will be received and we'll have them at our next meeting. Motion to adjourn. I motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting's adjourned. Yay. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Come to the next meeting, Kevin. <laughs>